Straw Hut Media. Hello on the Rockers. Pride Month continues and it's all about reading, not to filth, but to uh, actual books with author and podcaster Christopher Rice, the Liza Minnelli of the Rice family, <laughs> about his career, his work as C. Travis Rice, some hot topics we got, and much more with me, your sassy host with the sassy most. Raise a glass at the drinks begin. It's on the rocks. <laughs> And most poor suckers are starving to death. I'd like to propose a toast. This is On the Rocks with Alexander, where I drink with your favorite celebrities as we talk about fashion, entertainment, pop culture, reality TV, and, well, that's about it. So pop a cork, lean back, and raise a glass to On the Rocks. Fasten your seat. It's going to be a bumpy night. Yes. Lord have mercy. Buns and bows and pantyhose on the pod, on the Rocks podcast, place where we're too glad to give a damn. Okay, just everything. Like, there was so much traffic right now. There was, like, a fire and fire <laughs> engines. And my, uh, like, Uber driver insisted on stopping at the yellow lights, and he asked me for directions in L.A. Why do you think I'm not driving? <laughs> anyway, so we're just trying to calm down from all of that. Uh, follow us on Instagram and TikTok at On The Rocks On Air and on Facebook, On The Rocks Radio Show. Send me an email. Book me for a pride, wedding, funeral, quinceanera, bris. I don't care. I'll, I'll show up. Info at on the rocks radio show dot com. Send us your comments, your guest requests, and guest questions. We have your guest questions for tonight. The show's presented by Strawhead Media. You can watch and or listen to our now over 386 episodes for free uh, at ontherocksradioshow.com. You can also watch us on Apple TV, Roku, Amazon Fire TV on the Outa.tv app, Facebook Watch, streaming with Pride on SVTV, and on Channel 31 on the East Coast. Hello, East Coast. We proudly tape at UBN Go Studios, your one-stop place for podcasting. Okay, real fast, because we have so much to talk about tonight. Want to join On The Rocks on the Road? This Saturday, June 22nd, I'll be your MC all day for Out at the Fair at San Diego County Fair. Bring your family, bring your significant other, bring your side piece. Uh, it's the fair all day, gone gay. Um, <laughs> go to adatthefair.com. Um, it's very interesting because we're, it's not like it's just for the gays, it's everybody. So sometimes it gets a little dicey. Also, at the end of the month, come out to Palm Springs for Equality Wine and Food Fest, June 29th at Margaritaville. Uh, LGBTQ vendors from all over the nation with wine and food. I'll be on stage with NBC for tasting demos and more. Go to equalitywinefest.com. If you saw my um, appearance last year, you're welcome. <laughs> all right, let's get the show on the road. The man of the hour. I've been wanting to chat with this young man for so many years. Ooh, young, uh, young, thank young, you. <laughs> young, Christopher Rice, uh, who made his fiction novel debut 24 years ago, is the recipient of the Lambda Literary Award and is the Amazon Charts and New York Times bestselling author of A Density of Souls. And I'm going to talk about that. I was there like when the bookstore opened when it, when it came out. Uh, Bone Music, Blood Echo, and Blood Victory in the Burning Girl series. Um, and a Bram Stoker Award finalist for The Heavens Rise and the Vines. And he's an executive producer for television. He also collaborated with his mother, Anne Rice, on the novel Ramsey's the Damned, The Passion of Cleopatra, and Ramsey's the Damned, The Reign of Osiris. Together with his best friend and producing partner, New York Times bestselling novelist Eric Shaw Quinn, they run the production company Dinner Partners, among other projects. They produce the podcast and video network the Dinner Party Show, which can be found at thedinnerpartyshow.com. Um, in addition to his long list of novels, you can add tales of romance between men under that uh, under that heading, under the pseudonym C. Travis Rice, a.k.a. the Sapphire Cove Chronicles. The latest Sapphire Dawn comes out June 25th. Yes, of course I got an early copy because I am that bitch. I read it in one day. Nothing says pride like a steamy romance novel that has porn stars, Orange County, a luxury beach resort, <laughs> undercover agents, tight suits, and messy ex-boyfriends. <sighs> Please welcome Christopher Rice, <laughs> a.k.a. C. Travis Rice. Oh, that's the best intro ever. And I want to praise whoever did your photo curation because you picked the most flattering photos from my Instagram for that intro on your video channel. Thank you. Me. Thank you. You have good taste. Although I have one picture. I just want to know what the hell was going on. Tony, can you play the picture? He's like a little, little kid. <laughs> I think he's on stage or something. Oh, I could tell. Oh, what is happening? Oh, Episcopal School production of Godspell oh, rears its God. ugly head. You know, like, did you, did, did you go to a film. religious school? I went to Catholic school all my life and then I went to Chapman University that was first yeah. year of it not being a Christian so, college. Godspell was a no-no in Catholic school, as I understood it. Godspell was was hippy dippy. It was too yep. new Christian for and them. So yeah. Forget Jesus Christ Superstar. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That was out. That was out. So yeah, that was one. And everybody loved to do Godspell because they thought the costumes could be like that. Just wear pajamas and oh, a backwards a baseball cap. Yeah, like every high school loved it because totally. they're like, we have no overhead this year. I love it. <laughs> Absolutely, totally. And the music is good, but to watch Godspell, it's whenever my friends say, "Oh, I'm in Godspell," I'm like, "Oh." 
I'm busy. <laughs> like, yeah. I don't even know what it is. But Absolutely. I don't care. But totally. I the guess music's it, great. But... The, mu- the music is fun. It's catchy. There's a there's an elaborate... Actually, you know, I should correct myself because the Catholic Boys School in New Orleans did a production of Godspell when I was a teenager. I didn't go. I, I went to the school across town. This was the school where it, when we wanted somebody beat up, we got our friends who went to this school to do it for us because oh, we were it. all the rich, obnoxious kids. But, but um, <laughs> they did a production of Godspell. And Godspell has an opening number that is incredibly complex. Like there was no hope of us doing it in our production where they come out and they sing all, they're all the philosophers. I don't know if you're familiar with, and it's like this really rapid fire thing. And when it's done well, it's kind of amazing. Wow. And I always loved the thought of just the the mass of 11 year olds at my school, even <laughs> trying to pull off that number. <laughs> like there's just no way it would have happened. So anyway, it's weird what high schools are doing now. They're doing Les Miserables. They're doing Sweeney Todd. They're doing Grease. Of yeah. course they've been edited down. They're doing into the woods and now they're doing into the woods just act one i'm like yeah. oh my god steven sondheim is like no. just act one how yeah. does that work because act two you know is with death and themes yeah. and god forbid our children should learn about grief absolutely really. they might get triggered right? oh, okay yeah. we have so much to talk about we um do. number one we got so many questions from your fans oh, and number three uh, like i said i've been a fan for years and years and years um and so, you know, over the years I've cultivated, and I'm like, oh. And I've seen you walking around West Hollywood. Oh, I think one you? night, oh, many times. But I think one time, this was many years ago. And this was one pod, we're going to talk about your podcast. Because yes. you and I have been in it for many, have, many years when yeah. it was internet radio. And people were like, what's a podcast? Absolutely. But we knew what was going on. We knew, well, yeah. Um, but I think it was the early years. And, um, you know, when I'm in West Hollywood, I think our experience is a little bit different. I'm like at happy hour, right? I'm like that. <laughs> and I think by the time I saw you, it was evening. And I was like, oh, I got, and I just was such a fan. You know how when fans just gush and gush normally? I, 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 I Personally, I love that. I'm not going to complain about that. I don't so. think you were too impressed with my behavior. It's like, oh, my God. I just wanted to tell you everything at once. That's fine. But I, that's I, fine. I was like, you were like, oh, my God. Well, I, did, but I didn't have anything to do if I was out walking around West Hollywood because I, I don't go to the bar. I was just out to probably with friends at dinner. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I, I love it. Listen, the alternative is way worse. Walking around West Hollywood and nobody... Kn- Can I curse? Mm-hmm. What's it? Walking around West Hollywood and nobody knows who the fuck you are is yeah. way worse than having somebody come up and gush. Like, like I've got enough years that I... that I, I th- There have been some dips and valleys along yeah. the way that well, I'm really grateful for all the attention. <laughs> I'm not sending any of it back until it's time for me to go. Know what I mean? Well, I was <laughs> yeah. just like, oh, I, gotta, I gotta tell you everything. And uh, yeah. it was because uh, you were with friends. And you were just yeah. like, okay, okay. And I was clearly inebriated. So yeah, now but... I can just gush and gush and gush. Um, okay, uh, we're going to start like... This is yeah. your life, you oh, know. Yeah, absolutely. born in the Bay Area, grew up in San yes. Francisco till you were about ten. Kind of grew up around the Castro area. In, in the Castro, in it, right yeah. in it. Yeah. What do you remember about those early days? And you know, we're all supposed to remember everything when we were a kid, but sometimes we, we really don't. But what do you remember about those early years um, that taught you things about life that you still kind of subscribe to today? Oh, you know, those early years, particularly in comparison to what came after, were like an alternate reality. I was living in Northern California in the in the early to mid 1980s wow. in the Reagan era where all of that was being kept out by this army of progressive lesbian school teachers who ran the school I went to where we had no grades. I had a boyfriend who called it feel good no grade school. <laughs> like it was it was fantastic and it was it, and everything that came afterwards for like the first 5 years felt like a living nightmare yeah, because it, it had been this idol. But the other thing that was happening not to go dark is that we were living just two blocks from Castro and Market and this was one of the ground zeros of the AIDS epidemic. 100%. And and there were stores closing and there were men lining up to buy things like diapers in the drugstore that you wouldn't expect grown men to be buying and my mother's friends were getting sick and it was really I don't know another seven or eight year old who had yeah. kind of that kind of front row seat to what was unfolding in a neighborhood like that and I ultimately think that played a big factor in my parents decision to move to New yeah. Orleans I it's think that traumatic. well and in particularly when you add in the fact that they had had a child before me who had died of a bloodborne disease like yeah. anyway so that was definitely a part of it. But, you know, I went back to San Francisco recently with my um, best friend, Eric Shaw Quinn, who's also my podcast co-host at the Do Dinner Party Show. you always call him all, by, by yeah, three he, names? That's his Every time I talk about him, I always have to use three names. Everybody, best friend. But everybody calls him Eric Shaw Quinn yeah. because it just rolls off the tongue. Like, I always call him my best friend, Eric Shaw Quinn. In fact, I did an interview with <laughs> so my friend funny. who had a podcast, and he called the episode that because I said it so yeah. often during the episode. Anyway, <laughs> he's my best friend. What are you going to do? Everybody deserves a best friend. Um so we went back and I did a tour of the old neighborhood and it looks exactly the same. Like the those blocks of Castro. Yes, some of ca- it's frozen in time. Frozen in time. Cliff's Variety Store is still there. Fabuloso Books has replaced a different light, but that's it yeah. looks kind of the, the vibe is very yeah. much the same. The Castro Theater is still there. 
we we went and had coffee with my old babysitter who who her That's parents cool. shoe store she couldn't let it go and so she still owns the shoe store even though she doesn't make shoes there. anyway so it was to answer your question it was a completely idyllic time in my life and um but I went back there recently thinking, well, is there something here to go back to? Like, is this like the inverse of my mother's story? My mother got taken away from New Orleans when she was 14. Her father remarried. Her mother had, had died. So I thought, it, it, I got taken away from San Francisco kind of against my will at the age of 10. Do I want to go back? And I didn't really feel that. I kind of felt like L.A. had become my home after like 23 it years. It really of has. Yeah, I mean, right. you've really entrenched yourself in the community in many different ways. Mm-hmm. But San Francisco has changed over the last five years. So yeah. I used to date somebody for two and a half years, and every other weekend, he lived in San Francisco, I was here. Right. And so every other weekend, I was going there, or he was coming here. Right. And over the last few years, it's changed so much, I don't even like to go visit a- anymore because the culture's changed. I think the community has changed. I think COVID really depressed a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Um, and so it, it's, it's lost some of that magic and some of its charm. Yeah. I, Unfortunately. Yeah, I think so. And, you know, I remember going back on book tour just for brief visits and and people saying to me the same thing that was happening all over the country, which was that you don't have to live in the Castro to be gay anymore. They were moving out of the gay neighborhood. It's like the people who don't go to Fire Island anymore because they can go to Connecticut and, and yeah. the Hamptons and feel completely comfortable. So that was happening to the Castro some as well. And I, that sameness is in the physicality of it, right, in the buildings and the geography. Yeah. But you're right. San Francisco has undergone a lot of changes. We left right before the dot com boom. So it, it it was people complain about the way San Francisco is now and the level of the homelessness crisis there. And I'm like, this is San Francisco in 1985, 100%. my friends. Like, it totally felt familiar to me. I yeah. was like, it's fine. Just avoid the tenderloin and walk around that crowd of encampments, you know, like whatever. But um, it, it was an amazing city. And I, I think the city had more of an impact on her work and on my work than anybody gives it credit for. We're so associated. Both both mom and I were so associated with New Orleans I said recently, I asked my Facebook group, um, I can't remember what we're called, Rice Paper People or something. I, we, get, we came up with some cute name. The Rice um, Patties. The like, r- I want to be a Rice Patty. <laughs> <laughs> that, that was maybe number two. Um, but we, uh, yeah, I don't feel like we tried to be really careful with, uh, well, anyway, keep yeah. it food related. But um, <laughs> so we, um, I, I've forgotten what I was going to say, but it was something about San Francisco. Oh, I said, what what city do you associate with me with? And they all said, or my books yeah. with. And even though really only two of my books maybe are set in New Orleans, they all said New Orleans. Yeah, everybody responded. I mean, th- there's there's so many assumptions with you and your family's legacy, and I'm sure that just kind of plays over and yeah. over. Um, but now reading uh, your work as C. Travis Rice, yeah. Now I'm like, okay, OC boy, San Diego boy, mm-hmm. like I know this. It's such a different aesthetic from your so other different. work. Yeah. Um, and so I, I see why there's the 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 pseudonym. It's like you know what you're getting. That's the idea, and I get a lot of people who are like, "What are you doing? Why are you putting both?" names on the cover and it's it like look total sense. i need to tell you that this is going to be a different product there are not going to be any demonically possessed plants there's not going to be a face stealing serial killer this is going to be messy complicated boys l- falling in too. love yeah that's and fun idea. too where you could just like this was such a treat to read you know like since covid we've been through such a difficult time we know right, uh, right now socially and politically our community is suffering a lot mm-hmm. so it's so nice to just be able to read and enjoy and get little little down and, and mm-hmm. sexy and get a little gritty um uh, in a very positive way yeah and that's what i took it it was so enjoyable that's why i couldn't put it down because i was enjoying the experience and being put into the Sapphire Cove world so I'm much. I'm so happy to hear you say that. I'm so happy. I'm so, so happy to get the OC stamp of approval from an OC native. Because, yeah. you know, we're pretty tough. Yeah. I mean, that's a tough community. Yeah. <laughs> Trust me, I've been through the ringer. Um, but you captured the, the aesthetic mm-hmm. so well. Um, it's like when Stephen King writes about like Maine and Banger and all yeah. that, you know, it's like, okay, we get it. Like you get it. Yeah. Um, even like the, 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 the pattern of, of the, uh, um, Dialogue, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um. Now, when you were young, what kind of stuff were you reading? Were you reading like Dr. Seuss, Encyclopedia Brown? Uh, like w- what was happening? What was some of your I early literature? Wouldn't we had a little library at that experimental school, the lesbian run school I talked about, and, and there was a mass market paperback copy of Jaws by Peter Benchley. <laughs> And I kept going God. for it. And so the teacher finally put it up above where I could reach because she felt, as permissive as that school was, she felt I was too young to be reading Jaws. So I, if it was scary, I was after it when yeah. I was little. Yeah. I liked being scared, and I also hated being scared. 
And, you know, like, so Stephen King, and it was a big problem in my house that I was reading more Stephen King than Anne Rice when I was younger. I was reading Stephen King in fifth grade, and I never stopped. And from that point on, it was just Stephen King and Anne Rice because I thought I was so emo. Plus the themes, I liked, like you said, I like to be scared, and but I didn't at the same time. But it made me feel alive, and it made me transport to a whole different world. Right. That was fresh. Yeah, that's yeah, that's what I think I was after too, and I think that's what I'm still after. And I'm a little worried because I this is me getting on my soapbox. A lot of particularly romance novels right now, and I, I'm a big romance fan. I became a fan recently, and I became a fan largely as a result of having contempt prior to investigation when it came to what they call male male romance, which is really includes gay romance. Like I was like, what do these women think they're doing? They must not know the the, the sex scenes are going to stink. Um, and so I, I just ordered, uh, I, I finally, I don't remember what did it, but I went on Amazon one night and I said, I'm just going to order two books. What was happening is Amazon was really playing with their bestseller list. And so they were getting highly specific and it would be like, there would be a gay spy fiction that has a scene in Monterey, California bestseller list. And yeah. you'd be like, wow. But all the <laughs> titles on them were coming from authors I didn't know with gender neutral names. Gorgeous shirtless cover models. And One I was of my like, friends is a model for all. So he goes in and they do like a hundred different shots, and yeah. they use them for all these different novels. He never knows where he's going to pop up. Right, because they just pay him up front, and yeah. he signs away. Football player, being, a yeah. policeman. There was one. He had a questionable relationship with a horse, and he was like, "No, I need no, to know like no. what's happening." Yeah, because their shif- shifter things are big. Yes. But the, here's the thing: if it was a shifter thing, there's a rule in the shifter community that the paws and the hands need to match. So what that means is like... Well, he didn't want to be associated with a love affair with a horse. Yeah, that's true. But the horse could turn into like Fabio. You know what I mean? That's what the shifter thing is about. That's your dream? That's not my dream. No, this is not. Believe I am not endorsing horse shifter romance. I mean, it's everybody... Or Fabio. I, I don't want to yuck anybody's yum. I with the Fabio. I, I really... The fact that I'm on here as a romance fan making a Fabio <laughs> reference makes me sound complete like 10 years out of date. Like Fabio is great, but we have moved... There are other cover models out there. Anyway, so... Um, <laughs> <laughs> and I'm the one that didn't have a drink. Um, so I feel like we're watching She Devil. Remember, because she was a romance novelist. Oh yeah, yeah. totally. The whole I mean, Danielle Steele era. The portrayals of romance novelists in media are like you know because my experience of romance novelists is that they're really cool and they're really funny and they're like most of them are women and they're like that dry, clever. Um, Daria meets your favorite mom kind of thing. Like I, you know, I don't, I don't mean to pigeonhole them in gender roles, but like the the romance, the, really the thing that I think got me to write romance novels is that romance conferences were so fun. Like I had a friend early on in my career when I was going to mystery conferences tell the story of of when the mystery conference and the romance conference were in the same city. And she went to the mystery conference and everybody's like hanging out in the bar and there's a, the men are wearing pork pie hats and they're acting like they're PIs even though they work at you know Dow Chemical and all this sort of stuff. And then she went across town to the romance conferences. People are dancing on the yeah. tables and popping champagne and there's male strippers everywhere and they're giving away shit right and left. So like I was like, I want to I want to hang out with those people. But the the gay romance thing is, that, you know, I downloaded those two books I was talking about and I was completely swept away by both of them because I had this realization and I was so pretentious I was like well clearly one will not satisfy me so I, I will have to read two at the same time and it was like I had discovered like you were saying the happy but also like this TV network that was very genre and everything was gay and I had the realization oh right halfway through they're not gonna die yeah. they're not going to die the promise of a romance novel is a happily ever after so you can't use tragedy and loss as your plot climax and it could be fun just for the yeah. sake of being fun without exactly. pandering to anybody, too. Right. And li- listen, I had read a lot of really depressing but also beautiful and essential gay novels. Like when I was young and coming out in 1997, 1998, it was all about AIDS. We were all working through the AIDS crisis. That things had just changed dramatically because of protease inhibitors. Protease inhibitors came on the market and started impacting outcomes in the disease, I believe, in 1996. And I always tell the story of coming back grappling with my sexuality, having been to the gay bars a few times. I went on this trip to Italy with my family. I awkwardly came out to them. And on the way back in the airport, there was the newspaper article on the front page of the New York Times saying new class of drugs radically transform AIDS epidemic. And I was like, okay, good, because I was terrified, right? Of course you were. That's right? all we were fed. And yeah. you know, I went to a Catholic school, so all of our AIDS was just about Ryan White. Oh, God, and then yeah. about all the gays are dying and going to go to hell. Right. Now, I know you didn't come out to you like a senior in high school because you said you didn't yeah. really want to come out to you had a boyfriend. 
Well, I I really, really, really wanted to be bisexual. Yeah, and like I, your mom kind of thought you were, right? I, she thought I might be, and she said, interestingly enough, you were saying that Cry to Heaven was the book that kind of made you come out. She told me it to did. read that book because it she was said so beautifully done and treated with such respect. Right, and it was about love and emotion and feeling. Yeah, that's the first time I ever considered gay sexuality outside the actual physical and i still don't know how gay men actually had sex i right. had my ideas but i i hadn't even kissed anybody N nothing yeah and so that turned it into love and emotion and that's when i it clicked and i'm like oh you can be in love with somebody yes. it's not just about who you're fucking right exactly yeah and it's even more complicated in that book because they're castrati you, right and they're, exactly. they've been they've been castrated i think one of them at least against his will oh, and entered into the boys choir so it was it was like taking that the 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 specifics of genitalia out of the equation as well. I mean, it's still very relevant for people in terms of gender identity. That story, but I think her position in that moment was was if you are bisexual, embrace being bisexual. Yeah. Don't don't fall prey to that pick a side mentality that yeah. people give you. But it was like, as I like to say, the difference is you know it was nice to kiss a woman. It was nice to rub up against a woman. But when I did it with a guy, it was like lightning went yeah. off. And you realize in that moment, oh, this is what the other boys are feeling with girls. It actually feels like this. And it can be really psychologically dangerous because you've come to believe that a, a reduced, warped, uh, grasping version that you're trying to make work is the thing. And it's not the thing. Well, we discover that in uh, Sapphire Dawn with Donnie. The first yeah. time he actually has great sex and he's a porn star. Yeah. It's kind of this awakening. Um, and it's just so funny to me because your mom did bring up themes, and now we have the language for it. Mm -hmm. She was bringing up things like pansexuality, bisexuality, and such an open, non-binary even, right. was such a big theme, but we didn't have that verbiage. And mm -hmm. she was doing that before, so it's odd that you felt a little reticent in, in coming out and expressing that part of your life. Well, you know, and I, I think there is a, there's, the, there's mom as an island, and then there's everybody else. Right. And I yeah. think I was a little too focused on everybody else. Mm. And I think that that I you know, there were there were a lot of people in my life at that time who said, you're just doing this for attention. <laughs> it's like, let me tell you something. There are way better ways to get attention. Yeah. It, it was it was 1996. Like they were still saying things about gay people on television that would get you canceled today. And 100%. it was people who were like senators and yeah. celebrities. Yeah. So there were way easier ways to get attention. But. I, I think that it the ultimate struggle that that we all fight is within ourselves. You know, I think we that, that occasionally we can we can be assaulted, we can be attacked, but when it comes to our sexuality, what we're really wrestling with is our own definition of it. And the things that we say to ourselves uh, in the quiet of the night are far more powerful than what any bigot can say to us. And so, it's about not letting them in in those moments. I think. Well, this is what I love about your writing. No matter if you're writing a C. Travis Rice or whatever, you deal with these themes in almost everything you write. How you present them is different, mm -hmm. but it's that kind of reoccurring theme. You write a lot about forbidden love. Yes, you know I love what's it. taboo, uh, things that should be naughty, but love conquers all. Like that's a right. major theme that you put in everything that you do. Yeah, and so sometimes it's it's dramatic and it has gravitas, and sometimes it's fun and you work through it and you get excited yeah. about it. Yeah. Like Donnie's awakening, and you're just waiting for them to go down to that cove. Oh. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I um, love Donnie. Here's the thing about New Orleans, though. When you had to move when you were 10 years old, it was a bit of a culture shock. And, oh, you, yeah. and even in school, you felt like you'd never really clicked. And is it true you went to school with the Mannings? I did go to the school with the Mannings. I used to babysit one of the Mannings. Which one? Eli. Mm -hmm. He was, he was, it wasn't like that. He was perfectly oh, no. well behaved. Yeah. There were three kids down the I lived just two blocks away from the Mannings. That's so and <laughs> there were three boys who would hang out together and they would need two babysitters. Two, two older boys to be their babysitters to keep them in line. And Eli was not the one we had to keep in line. Eli was the well-behaved one that we were all oh, good. Eli's here, you know. So, but yeah, it, it was a couple times. It wasn't all the time, you know. But you were kind of that in that affluent group where like sports was the thing that boys did. Yes, it absolutely was. And, you know, we glamorize your relationship with New Orleans, but... Um, it, it was. It took a bit of adjusting to. It wasn't oh, this yeah. magical land that we think that you're roaming the streets in cloaks and you know putting yeah, spells on people. That's absolutely true. But I'll tell you something else I discovered later in life, and and some of it was about going back to San Francisco. That everybody who had been at that wonderful school with me 
had had the jarring transition of going out into the real world, even if they didn't leave San Francisco. And it was very, it was very healing to me to hear that because it wasn't ultimately about New Orleans. It was about we had been in a very special place that was run by a set of rarefied, very liberal principles, and the rest of the world was just not like that. Yep. And so I had to learn how I had to learn. I remember my dad saying, "You need to get good grades," and I said, "You will be happy with the grades I get." They're an expression of who I am. And he was like, oh, we got a lot of work to do here in the real world. Here's another poem. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Here we go. I'm going to get it in the next collection. Yeah. So he would have to wait on the front porch for me to bring my assignment book home every day. I had to learn how to be a student. Of course you did. You know, so anyway. Patrick Dennis in Maine when he was going to that, you know, school. And then he had to totally change his whole life. Absolutely. But there was an adjustment period. And then I kind of snapped into it and got used to the community that I was in. I cut my hair. I got rid of my rat tail. I. I put on polo shirts and khaki shorts for the pretty much the rest of my life in New Orleans. Like that was all I wore. And um, I found a place in theater is yeah. what I did. Mm-hmm. Theater was not the most popular choice in my high school. You know, athletics were. We were a big athletics high school. But by senior year, a lot of those things flattened out. Like I think people, the kids grow up. And so if you're someone who's always felt, I should say, a few steps ahead of the other kids. Yeah. Um, a lot of them catch up with you by senior year. And so I wasn't in this constant atmosphere of of fear and, and, and fear, feeling like I was going to be bullied or assaulted by like junior or senior year. But the first few years were tough. And I, I went to a new high school freshman year, which was a, was a big part of it. And I don't like being the new kid. That was what I walked away from. Who does? I, yeah. I don't like change in general. Yeah, no. Like I'll live in a house with the roof that's fallen in because I will I hate change. Right. Well, the, it is that was a change when the roof fell in. You realize that, right? That yeah. was a change. Yeah. <laughs> but I pretended like I wasn't. <laughs> it's like, well, the roof is still technically here. It's just in a different place. Okay. We won't. Yeah. But no, I know exactly what you mean. The piles in my house. It's like I don't want to deal with the pile of yeah. magazines. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> Um, so acting was a big part, and it's funny to think of you running around in polo shirts and and mm-hmm. shorts because we glamorize um, again your kind of relationship in the Rice family that you right. lived like in the Adams family home and you know Lurch was your butler yeah. and then like this this was but you were living the life as a real kid. Yeah. When did you first come in contact and start to saturate the content of your parents, your aunt? Like when did that? At what age did you start saturating that kind of content? Well, I'll tell you, there was a moment, and I I wrote about it recently in a forward for an illustrated edition of the novel interview with the vampire that's coming out. Gorgeous, soon. doesn't by the it way. look great? It looks they're gorgeous. doing an amazing job. It's it's not cheap, but there are multiple tiers. There are multiple editions at various price points. But stunning. It's, in 1985, I want to say, uh, we did. Uh, my mother was a marginally well-known novelist who had written a flop of a novel called Interview with the Vampire. Isn't that insane to think yeah. that that was a flop? It's insane. And it I think insane. the reason I tell the story is not like, oh, she wasn't all that. It's to tell artists that the initial response to your work does not determine the life of the work. So she puts this book out It's in 1976. It's very hyped. There's a pre-movie sale. The biggest paperback rights sale in history it, it unseats The Godfather by Mario Puzo, um, and it's a flop. And The New York Times hates it, and a lot of critics pan it. And she realizes in that moment that vampires are not being taken seriously, that she has written a very serious uh, book with high literary ambitions about an immortal's point of view, and everyone has gone, you have got to be kidding me. So she transferred over to historical fiction. That's how you got Cry to Heaven, which yep. we were talking about earlier. That's how you got The Feast of All Saints, which is another wonderful Beautiful. novel. Um and uh, then what happened was there was this steady drumbeat of this book being discovered, largely by queer people. Yeah. We're discovering Andrew Interview with the Vampire. And in 19, I think we were, she said, okay, I'm going to go back, but there's no way for me to go back to this series through Louis's point of view. Yeah. There's just, the, you can't do it. He's too depressive. He's too passive. He's a little whiny. Yeah, he's a, kind of, he's a little whiny bitch. That's kind of how I feel about Louis. Plus, um, I mean, let's, we love the villain. We love yeah. the sexy idea of the villain. Yeah. So when she made the decision of, I can have Lestat step forward and correct the record, everything reopened up for her. So she wrote this novel called The Vampire Lestat. And I think that this was like a wine and cheese book signing. It was nothing like the events that were going to follow. And three gorgeous men showed up in costume for the first time. Wow. And it was like rock stars had come yeah. because they looked amazing. As my aunt later said of them, and I never heard anyone use this expression again, one of them was, quote, shit in your pants handsome. <laughs> 
which she said <laughs> at the dinner something. table as we were going through photographs of them. And I was like, okay. So that was the beginning. And then, then they called to tell her that that book had debuted at number nine on the New York Times list. And she was screaming and jumping up and down in the kitchen. And then we flew to LA and, and she did a book signing where there was a line for the first time. So there was, a, it was 1985 to 1988 was a period of transformation in our lives that was unbelievable. And it really culminated, just to sort of wrap it up, when everything changed forever, was in 1988, The Queen of the Damned came out, and it shot to number one, and the, they were selling it out of the box in the bookstore. And we, at that point, had moved to New there. Orleans, and she, um, uh, we stayed at the Ritz-Carlton in above Central Park, and the publisher threw a big party for her, and nothing was ever the same. Yeah. Our lives changed completely. But had you read it before it was published? Did no. you read it? Oh, no. Like, how... So how did you first come in contact? When did you sit and actually read and start to understand? On a trip to Texas to visit my aunt, I took a copy, I was so contrary, of Belinda, a book she wrote called under her pen name, Anne Rampling, yeah, which a lot of people yeah. don't talk about today. 100%. Belinda is very controversial. <laughs> and I read it on the Amtrak train from Dallas to like San Antonio or wherever we we're going, as if it was just, you know, a cheap paperback yeah. that I had picked up at the train station. And um, I, she was on a local talk show in New Orleans, and I was in the audience, and I decided to ask her a question about Belinda. And she was like, her her eyes, if you can ever find the clip, her eyes like, you're going to ask me about that book? Or you're grounded. And yeah, you were so grounded. Also, your question is way too long. This is my interview. <laughs> anyway, that was really the beginning, but it took me a long time to to read her work. It was, it was defiance. It was resistance. It was also, I didn't know if I'd be that interested in it. I wasn't a bit, my aesthetic was Jaws. Like I was saying, it was Stephen King. It was way more down here on earth horror. Which is great literature too. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Jaws is a well-written book, but yeah. to read that at such an early age, yeah. um, you know, when I was reading Anne Rice and I was probably way too young for it, um, or just or just old enough, but yeah. But the novel that I really responded to was The Vampire Lestat because yeah. it was such a mix of Cry to Heaven and the, what I love from I Interview with the Vampire. And yeah. it's funny that when you read Interview with the Vampire, it's so modern still. It's right. just like, it's, oh yeah. You know, we, we, we forget how old that book actually is. I, I agree. And I think, you know, it's timeless. That's what I think. Yes. When you write about an immortal as well as she does, it turns into a timeless thing. Yeah. That was fresh. <laughs> The thing that I actually love most about the Bay of is the, there's a lot I love, but it's that opening where you're seeing a 300 year old creature see 1985 for the first time, yeah. you know, and you know, mom would say to me, like, I don't have a, a, I don't have a definition for the eighties in my head. I don't view the eighties as a distinct thing. It, for me, it is all the modern era, like everything after penicillin and the invention of electric, the, the wiring of homes for her that she saw the divisions in history as being much broader than that. Whereas I'm all about decades nostalgia right like i i love those things i on, still we're thinking yeah. that we're in the year 2000 oh god like, I, know. I still well, think. that's because we were we were young and very spry in that year right we yeah. still are but that's very interesting you say that because i don't see time having progressed since the 2000 mm. i don't see the fashion changes that everybody else sees i don't see the music changes that everybody else sees i just i get in this weird thing but the thing about your mom's work it's it's timeless legends that we love to uh, subscribe to, like right. Peter Pan, like Alice in Wonderland. No matter, no matter how many iterations we have of it, we still get excited about the content where it all originates from. Yeah, right, absolutely. Um, and then you talked about acting and doing theater. You had wanted to be an actor. You Ugh. went to Tisch, and then you left that. You're like, I'm going to go to L.A. You just picked up and left. You didn't even finish school. Oh, uh, You know, I, I didn't, and and I was, I was self-will run riot is what I was. I went to uh, Brown initially. Yes. And thinking I was going to take their theater department by storm. And spoiler alert, I didn't. I didn't get called back for anything, which for me, I had been the theater guy in my high school. And you're and tall, I was like, lean, handsome, leading I man. I really it's thought. Like, that was your time. I thought. But I'll tell you, I was in a period of my life where I was tall and lean is, is generous. I was rail thin. I was like those inflatable things outside the used car lots. You know, like I was like. There's a market for You see them yeah. everywhere. Oh, there was a market for them and they were all 50. But um, they, they uh, so I transferred to NYU to do dramatic writing. That was really, I was in their screenwriting yeah, yeah, program. Yeah. And I left after a semester and I just wanted to do, it, look, the life at the Anne Rice estate was really good. It was really hard to leave the big house with the staff and the, all the sort of stuff. Home. It was really hard to leave. And so I would make these attempts at school, but eventually I made some friends out in Los Angeles. And I have to tell you, I came out here for a visit and I fell in love with the place. I fell in love with the place in a really sort of childlike, wide-eyed way. I think part of it was because a lot of it was reminding me of Northern California. 
There are big differences between the two regions, but the geography is similar. The cold air coming in off the ocean is similar. The complete, well, used to be, the complete lack of humidity. There was a sort of, I, I felt an electricity in the air out here, and I, I realized I could make a life here, and it would never matter if I had anything to do with Hollywood. That I was, I didn't take to New York. I didn't, I didn't feel a sense of possession in New York the way I, I'm good for four days in New York, and then I want everybody to be quiet and take a nap. You know I what I mean? I said this yesterday. Yeah. I said, I'd love to go to New York, and I'd love to see theater, but if I'm there for more than four days, I four get days depressed. Is I'm it. like, I cannot wait to get home. That four is days so is weird. It. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and plus, when you first moved to West Hollywood, it, it was an exciting time. It was an amazing time. And no offense, you were an affluent, white, attractive was. guy. It was much easier for you to I had a good time. M- yeah. mix in. Yeah. My transition to West Hollywood was a bit odd. Yeah. Um, so you kind of, like, through all of that, um, and you're like, okay, I'm going to... Uh, merge with LA yeah. and then we shoot to 2000 and I remember it was like yesterday it was when mm. your first fictional uh, uh, novel came out Destiny of Souls right Density right yeah yeah. Um, and everybody was so excited I was there this was before you could pre-order on Amazon and you know mm. you were there when the bookstore opened wow you know and so me and the fans because and not to put so much emphasis on your mom's legacy but that's that was my introduction to you right so and I joke that you're the Liza Minnelli because you have this <laughs> You have this whole Lester's career on your own, but right. you're also part of a legacy. Right. And we appreciate that. Thank you. I mean, so your first novel, that's what we were all were like, oh, what kind of pressure was it? And I know you wrote the novel when your mom got really sick. Yes. And you had to go back to New Orleans. Right. Can you talk about how that kind of inspired you? And you're like, you know what? I'm going to sit and write a book. Well, you know, it was a it was a build up to that particular story because what the, I like to say what that novel was was several ideas that had been circling which I thought were going to be screenplays because I was out here and I was trying to do that. It does read very serious. It's v- very, very much so. Um, a friend of mine, one of the first friends I made out here invited me to take part in a reading series which used to happen. I think it's moved to the, the East Coast now. And um, interestingly enough, my best friend Eric Shaw Quinn helped start that reading series. It was called Spoken Interludes. And uh, they said, just read a short story. And I was like, I've never written a short story. I said, I said, I've never finished a short story even. And I thought, well, this is an opportunity. And it felt kind of like a theater thing as well. It was something where sometimes the authors who had a story read would have a famous actor read it for them if they weren't comfortable. So I wrote this fucked up short story that was just all of my repressed sexuality and rage at the Garden District in New Orleans. In And it was, without spoiling anything about a book that's been out 20 years, it was the bell tower scene. It was the secret of what happened in the bell tower in A Density of Souls. And that was it. It was that short story. Wow. And it was, a, it was basically a story about a gay rape, for lack of a better term. And I read it to this mixed crowd in this bougie West Side LA restaurant, because that's where we did the reading series. And there was a mix of sort of well-known actors there. Grace Zabriskie was there, and the uh, Wendy Malick, I think, was at a later one. And so it was, we love it, Wendy Malick. It was very LA, and actually, uh, Wendy Malick, I think, was at that one because her reaction to it when she came up afterwards and just shook my hand, I thought, "Holy shit!" Because I, I felt like I was doing this crazy thing. I downed like five glasses of wine reading this really gay story in this crowd full of people I didn't know. The response to it convinced me that it could be something else. And so when I went home, because my mother slipped into a diabetic coma. Uh, which was very... Uh, when we didn't know she was diabetic, yeah. Um, and I had downtime at night away from the hospital. And I didn't really go back home. I always used to tell that story. and you know, It would make it sound like you know I just crawled away from her bedside to start working on this book as she was gasping for breath. That's not really how it went down. But um, I was home unexpectedly because she had become ill. I just started... You know, and it, to answer the other part of your question... I just dove in blind. I didn't know any better. You have a creative process. You right. Just, you just... just dove in blind, and I just took the attitude that maybe what I was writing wasn't publishable, but it could be fixed down the road. And it was and therapy, it, it sounds like. It was like. totally therapy, and it was totally emotional and raw. And I said, you never have an experience like that again, writing your first book, because you've never been reviewed. So you don't have any book critics living in your head. Um, so, so it was a very pure experience and you can really just convince yourself you're writing the greatest thing ever and it may, all of it might not work, but you know what I mean? Well, so, New York Times bestseller yeah. list, you know, well, that's thank you. All, you know. I mean, I think in, in the, in the detractors who say, you know, it's all the result of your mother, I think maybe one book, maybe two books you get off your mother, but I think now I'm almost at 15. So but I think it's even I more drastic because the fans will call you on it. If the first book is awful, 
you know, like if Liza went out and she croaked on stage. Yeah. Um, who was that uh, celebrity kid that just came on the Hollywood Bowl stage and was? Oh God! Oh God! It was so. Uh, <laughs> it was cringe, right? It was. <laughs> it was yeah. So I think even there's even more pressure, and so I wanted to talk yeah. with that about you know what kind of pressure because and I'll be in all honesty, we're very honest on the show. You know, we were kind of like, oh, the son of Anne Rice, mm-hmm. we're going to get a gay vampire, gayer yeah. vampire book, and it wasn't that. No. But it's still, it caught your attention and drawn to the story and drawn to your separate aesthetic. Your yeah. way of writing is so different. Yeah. But it still captures the essence of, of characters in, in all your work. Thank you. Thank you. I, You know, she used to say to me, Anne used to say, you as a writer process your present in a way that I don't. Like I, she said, and she would say things that sound vaguely insulting, but she wouldn't mean them to be, which is like, I could never write a book about going to high school. And I was like, okay, maybe the themes aren't as elevated in times. But she, what she really meant was you, you are psychologically processing your experience as a human being by way of your present. And for her to get to where she wanted to go creatively, she needed to go into the past. She needed to go into the vampire's point of view. That was where she found her truth even though she was expressing a truth that was relevant in the present, I think. So that was kind of, and that helped me because I think if I thought I had been writing something that was similar to her or an imitation of her, it would have completely shut me down. It would have been sincere. Yeah. It would have probably not been good. Yeah. I mean, I don't, I, and what kind of vampire world would I have created? What hadn't she done in the vampire yeah, world? Yeah, well, that's you very know? true. I would have, it, I mean, like, maybe I could have written, like, the vampire Fred, you know, and he's a truck driver. You know, I, 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 I <laughs> Well, like, the easy thing would be to have taken one of her characters and kind of expanded on that in a right. different light. Yeah. You know. Um, in the inside her world, which was something it took me years to get comfortable yeah. to do. I mean, we, we, it wasn't until I, really a few years ago that we collaborated right. on a book together. But yeah. We're going to get there. We're going to yeah. get there. Um, a Snow Garden, your second book, was also hit. And then I remember the headlines all started coming out because, you know, I would get, what were the magazines at the time? The gay ones? The genre. There was, oh, Genre. Yeah, I, I worked for Genre for a period. Genre, Instinct. Advocate, which you also Advocate, worked for. Advocate, Out. Advocate and Out are still around, I yeah, think. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're, they're online, but out. They're online, right. Yeah. Um, but I remember I would go to Barnes and Noble, even in Orange County, and I would get People Magazine and all that. And yeah. in between, I would sandwich genre. And and uh, so totally. they started doing interviews with you, and it, all the titles were gay author. Yeah. And I know you've talked about this before. And it's like, yes, you have gay characters in your books. And maybe at the time, that was like, oh, wow. But because we also knew your sexuality, that was your that was your headline. Yeah. And can you talk about how, about how frustrating that must have been? Because you were creating stories with full characters, full families of characters, what actual reality looks like, and we all have gay friends and, and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Given that headline, yes, it gave you a lot of good gay press. It gave you a, hordes of gay fans. But it must have been frustrating when you're like, I'm an author and I'm an artist. Well, it was frustrating and it wasn't frustrating because I think it, there was a sense that, and this was something that was said to me, I think, by some journalists that... I had, because of the last name, one of the positive effects of the last name uh, was that I had been able to vault this very gay content over this wall that would have been placed in front of someone that didn't have the last name right. Exactly. New York City. And the press. I mean, that was really what was happening. The media attention for the first book, I think, blew everybody out of the water. They weren't, we weren't expecting, I wasn't expecting to be on the Rosie O'Donnell show, you know, like... Uh, I wasn't expecting to be on the cover of The Advocate. That was an interview that was booked, and then they called back and said it's going to be a cover. We have a picture of that. Oh, yeah. The one in the Steelers jersey. I was that that little uh, goth football twink, I think, was the. I I think that was it. But here, the gays, like, we were also putting your picture up on our walls. We were, you know, because you were like, you were the hottie author. That's fine. I have no complaints about that. I have absolutely no complaints about that. I think that where I would get tripped up about it is that the term gay author can imply, or it used to imply, that you are not writing anything that is relevant to straight yes. people, as opposed to books that heavily include gay sexuality. Mm. But these were books that were very much about being gay. I, I wrote one book that I saw a lot of people who were fans of the first two turn away from, which was Light Before Day, where I really dug into some stuff that I was seeing as a more grown-up gay person that was not popular. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was almost like an exploration of Me Too before we were ready to talk about right. Me Too. So, and it probably scared a lot of people. It scared a lot of people, you know, and it was a very dark book. It was written after my father died. But so there were, it was not always, I mean, even among the gays, there was controversy and discussion. And I think I always go back to, you know, people ask me about book talk, right? Or people, do you like book talk? Are you okay with book talk? And I said, listen, 
Whatever people want to say on Book Talk is great. What's, what's Book Talk? You don't know what Book Talk no, is. So TikTok, which is a popular app. Yeah. Book Talkers. Honey, I know what TikTok is. Right. You're okay. Like, well, this old man doesn't know what Book Talk is. <laughs> well, you don't know what Book Talk is. I was like, okay, so we're gonna start at square one here. There's a this thing is called a phone, and then on it are apps. Anyway, so um, Sapphire Book Talk, the next novel. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the, on TikTok, book influencers are a big deal. Or they, or they were very much a big deal, particularly around the pandemic when, when TikTok launched. Colleen Hoover's success. Colleen oh, Ho- I am so sorry. I know yeah. exactly. CBS right. uh, Sunday Morning did a whole piece on this. Yeah, absolutely. Boom. Now it just They're clicked. big, very influential. Yeah. So people, but now people, people complain in certain segments of the publishing community. Oh, they only like one type of book, which isn't true. All the sorts of I said, listen, this is, you want to know what bothers me? When no one is talking about yeah. books. Because that is something that has been hanging over us since the, I entered into the publishing arena in 2000, is this constant sense that the love of books is eroding. So if people want to get really excited about dragon novels, more power to them. You yeah. know, that's, that's how I feel. Christopher, I, I agree with you so much. You know, I review a lot of books. I write a, a lot of authors. We have a lot of authors on. And right. I refuse, if I can't get a physical copy, because mm-hmm. it's the thrill of having it. It's the aesthetic of yeah. being able to flip the page, being able to underline something, being able to earmark yeah. something. Um, but I also miss, and as a queer kid, I would go to Barnes & Noble for hours. Oh, yeah. Because it would become my Alice in Wonderland. I'd be right. transported to another world where nobody bothered me. Oh, yeah. And I could look at everything and be in my own world, and I felt safe there. I still go. I still, I mean, we've got to- To find a bookstore is so hard. It is getting harder. We still have Book Soup in West Hollywood, yeah, which, which is great. Is amazing. Uh, we still have the Barnes & Noble at the Grove. I live which right is across like, the street. Right? Yeah. So that's great. We still have the bookstore in Studio City, where I used to live. But Christopher, it's, we also live in an LA bubble. We do. Yeah. I'm talking about youth around the nation that yeah. doesn't have that that thrill for books right and then they have a 30 second attention span because they're on tiktok i i think that's definitely true i think the thing that that concerned me when the gay bookstores started to close yeah. was that they were a place to go that wasn't about booze but it was about being gay and i liked that and and also i was very popular there I, so i sold like so many books out of a different light in west hollywood when i lost that store i was devastated but i have such a funny story for you, you tell me tell me tell me no no you go first yeah. you're the guest well no it's, it's what, you know <laughs> how much can i talk about it i, 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 I bemoan the loss of signings. we were gay all there fanning ourselves but here's the thing about what would happen at a different light is like you'd be doing an event and i did some wonderful events there where wonderful people came Rue out McClanahan was there and then there would be a noise off to your left from the older gentleman who was sitting on the floor going through every back issue of Honcho and in Inches that they had. Honcho, Honcho Inches, inches Blue back. Boy. Oh, yes. yeah. But that was the thing. You told your story earlier about sandwiching the gay magazines. Like when I was a young gay living in, I'd lived initially in the Valley, uh, I would go over the hill and I would go to a different light and I would buy a bunch of porn and a copy of A Death in Venice. <laughs> like, cause I, I, not like I wasn't hiding it. I was just like, I want you to think I consume something gay besides all of these porn silly? magazines. Was fresh. I was born and raised in Orange County. The only thing we had in Laguna Beach was called Gay Mart. Right. I drove by five times before I actually pulled in. Mm. And even there, I felt like I had to buy like a mainstream magazine yeah. because it was just, it's ingrained in our head. Because the lesbian behind the counter would judge you. As if. No, yeah. it was a gay guy behind. He's yeah. like, I live right up the street. I could lock the store up. And I was like, oh, wow. And I was just afraid just to even go in. So even yeah. that kind of, like, yeah. I ran out without doing anything. Well, like, that ah. is a little creepy. So, yeah, I understand. Okay, so different light in West Hollywood. Yes. Amazing. Um, this when I first came to West Hollywood. And, you know, I was doing, uh, I was working at Citibank, which is now Rocco's. Right. Oh, um, my God. And then uh, one of the owners was like, why don't you come at night and work the evening shift? Because it's fun. You get to meet people. Because I, I didn't know anybody. Mm-hmm. I didn't even know that. W- I worked at Citibank for three months before I even knew that gay bars were across the street. Oh my God. Because I was in my own little bubble. Yeah, sure. So I took the evening shift, but it didn't start till nine. So what was I going to do between six and nine? Rage, Mickey's, whatever. Right. So I worked for a couple of weeks until I showed up and they're like, no. no. <laughs> so I was like, wow, what's going on, everybody? <laughs> You're just a bookstore. Yeah. How high stress are you going to be? Everyone's just reading. <laughs> well, I mean, what? Um, okay, we, I want to talk about your collaborations with your mom. Ramsey's yes. the, the Damned Book. Two right. books. Two books, yeah. What was that point where both of you were like, you know what, let's kind of merge our our styles together. And, you know, you've talked a little bit, or you've written a little bit about Supernatural, but not in such a big way. Not totally in Not in, in a historical world. way, right. which is really not in a so I never written anything historical, and I found that very daunting. And I'll tell you, if, if very we, daunting. we hadn't been plugging into a world she had already built, I don't know if it would have worked. I don't know. Building something from the ground up would have been a very different endeavor. But this was a sequel to a book that she had released in the 90s that got, it was very popular, but it got sidelined by 
that Queen of the Damned moment I was describing earlier. The vampires just took off, and nobody I remember Queen of the Damned nobody Damned. gave a shit about another mummy book. And she and but the, but people kept coming to signings, and they kept saying, "When's Ramsey's coming back?" It ended yeah. on a cliffhanger. So uh, we we um, what really happened is that we worked together on a screenplay of Tale of the Body Thief that never saw the light of day. And this upsets fans so much because we know yeah. how many things have almost done and then yeah. not. Yeah. I'll tell you, this is what I'll say about that. If you read the screenplay, <laughs> because it was written in a studio environment, pre-streaming, pre-peak TV, and a lot a of world. compromises were being made. And there was a sense that we had to write the Vampire Chronicles as a superhero franchise. That was what they were saying. This needs to be like, because that was what was big. So uh, maybe it could have been saved, you know, if we had brought in a director who could have who could have fought the studio on some of this stuff. But so we were able to survive that experience together. And the script that I wrote for her, according to her notes, so she didn't actually write it with me. I wrote it and we 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 talked about it a lot. Um, got the studio to come to the table, so that was the big moment for that project. But ultimately, it wasn't picked That's up. Huge. Yeah, and that was that was a, a great day for me. So we learned that we could do it. Yeah, and we had our moments, and we had our we had our fights, and we had our rows. But I was going to ask about that, it. you know, yeah. because two totally different voices. Yeah, and then working with your mom, I worked with my mom on many different projects, not obviously on your level, but there's this familiarity that also is you can be the most mean to this person. Yeah. You can get frustrated with this person because the way that they chew because you're mm-hmm. like, they're your family. Yeah. What did you learn though about writing the most from working with her? You know, I think you have to ha you can't be her son when you're working together. Hmm. You have to be her colleague. And I think she had her own process of I'm not his mother when we're working together. I'm his colleague. And I think we are both are, you know, she was and I am workaholics. So we kind of breathe our work. And I I, I have this attitude and I think she did, too, for most of her life that my dream came true and I got to do what I want to do. So I should do it all the time. Sometimes I can do it to excess. So we didn't have trouble living in our work together. Yeah, I, I think that was important. But. This, this, she taught me a lot, and I. There were moments where I wanted to throw a child's tantrum and say, "No, I don't want to do this this way," just because you're saying we should. And it's like, wait a minute, your mother's fucking Anne Rice. You know, she sold way more books than you, <laughs> but she had charted out these characters and she had built this world, and I think she knew the contours of it better than I did. And but what she did, which was brilliant as a strategy for working with me, is that she let me go off with one of my bad ideas and kind of experience it on my own and realize that it was bad and just parenting kind yeah. of too yeah you Smart know I, parenting. I don't know how well you know the books or if it's, it's important but the, the idea was you know the ramses novels feature the resurrection of the queen cleopatra using the elixir of life and when she's brought back we can't tell if she's a monster or not or if she's the real cleopatra and i was so committed when we sat down to do book two because cleopatra survives book one spoiler alert um I was so committed to, no, we need a monster. We need a stalking hammer horror movie villain. She needs to be terrible. And I was like, that's not the world of Anne Rice. Yeah. Anne Rice didn't do villains. Anne Rice took the villain and made them complicated. You know what I mean? Like she didn't do slashing serial kills. If she did, they were going to die on the first page because Lestat was going to drink them dry. You know what I mean? But here's the thing. And even I referred to Lestat as the villain, but he's he's really not. He's a beautiful convoluted person like we all are well, like yeah. a lot of the characters yeah Sapphire Cove by yeah, the way thank you. I, I love it though you brought it back to the no, book of the moment I yeah. see all these levels even in a romance novel and I, I say even in romance novel and I don't mean to be insulting I know what you mean though but it's like you know uh, it, it's it has that import and it has that that mm-hmm. substance to it yeah. which makes it the journey even more fun yeah, and I think there are, there are temperatures and gradations of romance that are all great. There's really yeah. light and fluffy, and yeah. deliberately so. There's I want a total escape. I I want to I want to read about two people falling in love who work in a candy store, and then there's what I do, <laughs> which is it's like got this candy coating on it, but there's kind of some rock salt and a few sharp edges in the middle because I it's really like undercover agents. Yeah, the undercover agent thing is new to this. And the, fun moms too. Yeah, I, I love a fun mom. I love fun moms, but as I was telling somebody else the other day about this book, I'd written I'd written I've written four of these books now, and two of them have really great mothers in them. 
it was time for a really terrible mother who was just a bitch. And that's who Richard's mother is in this book. I didn't take that at all. Oh, she is. Uh, she's like the stuff. Karen Walker, the oh. fun. And she's like, throw him over the balcony. But do you want, <laughs> that's why the time we get to the end. But in the beginning where she's calling him and saying, you know, your, your disaster at the party that's making the news is affecting my bridge game. You know, she's all about her, like all the time. Well, and Richard really like internalized it too. Yeah. And yeah. it became a part of everything that he did. And Absolutely. I think, but I think it's also why he challenged himself too. Totally. Anyway, um, so what did what would you think you learned most about working about writing from working with your mom? One one takeaway piece. Well, you know, there's an old Stephen Sondheim saying, "Whoever is the most passionate wins," mm. and that could be hard with Anne because she was passionate about everything. <laughs> she was, a, but I think that that um, she was very generous with me when it came to plot. She would say things to me that were very complimentary, like, you have a grasp of plotting that I don't. She said, you braid your storylines in ways that I don't. She said, I want to write storylines that are Victorian. I want the amazing character to sit down at the table and tell you his story. And I don't want to get caught up in why he's telling you his story. He's telling you his story because he's fucking amazing and he's lived forever. The witching hour is full of that. Oh, yeah, that's it. And the fans are there for it every Absolutely, because it takes you down a different 300-year pathway. I'm, I'm a plotter. I like... This idea that I write a lot in third person, I like to be, I'm the camera, and I'm showing you a godlike perspective on these characters, and I'm showing them changing and growing and developing. I'm I'm way more traditional, sort of almost like writing school, writing program, in my approach. And there were elements of that that she admired, specifically when we were working on screenplays, because, yeah... So th- so I, I learned a lot, but she, she gave me some ground in that area. But I learned what, you know, we did a whole draft of the first Ramsey's book I did with her. And she read it, and she got back to me, and she said, Christopher, these characters are immortal. So let's not have them talk in this sort of snarky way. Let's, let's not have that. You know, like it was a shift. It was like yeah. you have to realize you're writing from the point of view of someone in that character. We have an immortal who is thousands of years old. I mean, she makes some of the vampires. Like Beck Totten, the queen of Shaktanu, she is beyond. And so she, did ne- she never wanted her immortal characters to be overly concerned with what she called the pedestrian or the domestic, right? That if you're a, a vampire who's hundreds of years old, you're not going to get in a fight in the kitchen with another vampire about where to put the napkin, okay? She didn't want those scenes. you're not going to pick up like colloquialisms that will be gone in 10 years. No, exactly. Exactly not. So it was was a great experience, you know, and and, and she left me with a burning desire to write historical fiction. That's really, because that was something where I said, I can't do this. And and her, she lived her research, lived her research, like up into the last weeks of her life, she had a book open on her lap. You know, and and she would never have to really sit down and say, well, now for book 712, whatever it was, I need to research this. She would have it filed away in her brain and she would have here are the books on the Carolingian Empire that I was reading when you guys were here at Christmas. You know, she had this enormous library, which we're dealing with now. So all of that, that obsession, I, I always say the only thing that you really need to be a writer is obsession. And you need to be writing about the things you are obsessed with. And Whether like you they're going to sell. A, a workaholic. You yeah. can't just be like, I only write three hours a day. No. Well, well, you know, like you can only write like sometimes two or three hours a day. But, but your you, ideas something's are going, going on up here. Yeah, right. And yeah. you're researching because you love to do the research associated with the idea. If all of it feels like work and a grind, you may be trying to bark up the wrong tree. Not in terms of writing, but in terms of what, what idea you're fleshing out. Uh, well, I think the marriage of your coming from that kind of screenwriting point of view, right. because it's like, okay, let's let's see where the story is going. Let's keep you know the audience. I, 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 that's great. Yeah. 2014, you decided to get a little sexy. Mm-hmm. You started to get a little erotic. Yeah. Um, Flame was your first. Yeah. Um, and that, what kind of sparked you to be like, okay, let's do sexy things? You know, I got a, I got approached to do it. And, you know, I'd had that experience I described earlier where I I downloaded those two queer romance novels, you know, and I I learned that I was being a bigot about women writing these books. But I also learned that it was a much queerer space than I realized, that a lot of those gender neutral pen names were about um, queer women and trans people who had to use a pen name to uh, avoid harassment in their day jobs at work. Uh, which has always been a thing with people who write sexy stuff, particularly if they work in education. Oh, now, now in Florida, you know, like all of it. Um, but it's always been an issue. So 
But I was at a I was at a dinner party uh, with a friend of mine, and the author Steve Barry was there, and his wife Liz Barry was there, who I was just sort of getting to know. And Steve says, "You should ask Christopher to be in this new project you're doing." And Liz was like, "Gee, thanks, Steve. I just met." But they were a thousand and one dark nights was a series of it was basically harnessing everything that was going on with the internet in erotic romance, you know, because whatever you think of the book, um, Fifty Shades of Grey was a sea change moment in the romance industry because it was the first time somebody made erotic romance work on a huge commercial scale. There had been attempts to do it. There have been a lot of wonderful writers doing erotic romance. I don't mean to erase them from the slate, but she really broke out with it and she widened the field for what those authors could do commercially in terms of their sales. Every person owned this book. Yeah, every person. every person. And you had curiosity seekers go after it. That's what happens when a book gets that big. And it's why it has so many haters, because you have people weigh in who would never normally read an erotic romance before. But um, They still read every page. They still read every page. And there are a lot of pages that are really hot in that book. So um, this project, 1001 Dark Nights, they were trying to... It was, a, it was an unprecedented cross-marketing thing where they were bringing together romance authors who were committing to promote each other's novellas once a month on social media. So they were going to release one a month. Anyway, there's probably more information than you need. They asked me to write a novella, and they said, you'll be the horror guy. And I said, okay, because I was doing horror novels at the time. And I said, you know, I've been reading more romance, and I think I can try a romance. And they were like, okay, if you want. Like, we're happy to have you. You have a, a backlist. You, I was like, and so I wrote what they called a menage romance, and it was two boys and a girl. It was a straight couple basically falling in love with their gay friend, and you know, the coding is if it's MFM, the boys don't touch, right? If it's MFM, it's like they're sometimes they're brothers and not in that Carnal Plus way. They're like brothers who, you know, like... I know everybody at Carnal Plus, by the way. <laughs> Hi, LeGrand. Can you introduce me? <laughs> um, so... Uh, <laughs> Can you imagine a porn studio doing one of your scripts? That would be amazing. That would be a dream come true. And the studio that you describe? Yeah, I love this You studio. must have visited one because Listen, that's literally how it is. Here's the thing. I, in San Diego area, I by the way. love porn. I have always loved porn. I would rather watch porn than have a stranger in my house because I, I tell a lot of true crime stories and it just takes one stranger <laughs> and one knife to really turn you into a sad Facebook post on your friend's page. So, but I love stupid porn, right? Like I love, this is such good stuff. I love like the seventies, eighties porn where like we're all in an office and we are up to no good with people we should not be fooling around with, and the dialogue is bad, and that's fine, and it's I all that archetypal. Story and the yes, I absolutely. don't fast forward through anything. I want the setup absolutely. because it makes the payoff even better. When they go and right want to it, it, I'm like, eh. and I want it to be wrong. Like I want, I want it to be performed by consenting adults who have been tested and signed consent forms, all that sort of stuff. But I want the fantasy to be something that taboo. I would never do. That that's it, in almost all of your. Absolutely. Like romance erotic stuff is totally. taboo. That's my that's my thing because like some of it is like I adopted believe... bro brother sister. Like yeah, I mean, I was yeah. like, yeah, totally. Yeah, you know, like I, I that's what's exciting because I think that's why we have fantasy, and I think a lot of us walk around with with crazy, uh, dangerous fantasies that we never act on, and so they don't become or can't dangerous. Talk through it, right? You know, and not to uh, validify, uh, Arnie Hammer has come out lately, mm -hmm. and he's starting to talk about his sexual cannibal fantasies. Mm. He's making light of it. But again, it's a fantasy in his mind that he allegedly talked about, wanted you know to explore. But he, like he's he, the way he put it, he's a little flippant for me. Mm -hmm. um, but he says, "I never ate anybody. I'm not a cannibal because you have to eat somebody. So I would never eat somebody." Mm. But it's these kind of fantasies. That was fresh. Well, I think porn is important because it allows people to entertain fantasies that they would never do in everyday life in a completely contained way. And I think as a, as a fully realized adult, you need to sort of be aware of what your fantasies are and be aware of the difference between fantasy and reality. 100%. And I don't think the presence of fantasies is indicative of, of a pathology. I think it's a, it comes down to either behavior is destruct behavior can be destructive a fantasy alone can't be destructive and so i've always been a big free speech advocate and i but but that's not why i love porn that's all I, I didn't mean to get all high flown you know like the problem that i have today is like i love only fans and i love what it's done for performers and allowing them to monetize but i, 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 I I'm just i'm going around i'm not even drunk um but i have trouble getting turned on by your messy apartment like <laughs> 
<laughs> and I'm just gonna, that's I'm, the biggest complaint. I'm gonna of get Fan really controversial. I'm getting really controversial here. I adore Austin Wolf. I I want to be Austin Wolf for like a week. I want to walk in his shoes. He gets to sleep with some of the hottest twinks ever, but clean up your fucking hotel room. Oh, he show, doesn't care. All show, the way to the bank. I don't care. Show some gratitude for the fact that you get the best bottoms on the planet. Okay, but to come let's, through. He's Donnie before he meets yeah, Richard he is. because he is. his sex is like this. Him and ever, never mind. I was name somebody else. <laughs> it was one of my friends, but they just do this like mindless, passionless sex because they know that they are hung. Right. They know that people fantasize about them and they do the most boring scenes I've ever, ever seen. Well, you know, and it's, 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 but you know, when Austin Wolf does scenes at men.com, they can be really fun and exciting. I mean, like, so, no. It's because okay. of the bottom. The bottom, yeah. you notice the bottom's like doing a trapeze well, in front of them. It's, it's all about like, the bottom. It's all about the bottom. But sometimes, you know, when. He was on Sniffies in West Hollywood visiting, by the way. This w- last what week. is that? What is Sniffies? I don't know. I'll tell you later. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was that guy. was my my soapbox about porn. But that's why I I wrote a romance novel about a porn star. I mean, a porn. He's not an active performer anymore, which would be a different kind of story. But he still has that baggage. But he's, he's he's got the baggage, but he's also got the the self actualization to be like, look, this is what I do. Porn is not sex. Porn is performance. Porn is a job. Um, we we don't. Our studios are not drug dens because we couldn't have effective sex. And porn is about performing sex for the camera. So. You know, there's like so he, much sobriety in the porn industry. People don't realize. Yeah. And if you want to have really healthy sex, where people have been tested and t- and know exactly yeah. what ST- STIs they have, have sex with a porn star right. because it affects their job. I also loved how this group of rich women love watching oh, gay yeah. porn. That was so fun for me. But what I love what you're doing is destigmatizing sex because yes. we know we are vilified as gay men because of our sex. Mm-hmm. Um, and you're like, we all have these fantasies. And so yeah. no matter whether you're writing about a, a straight situation or a bisexual situation or you know a gay situation, mm-hmm. we all have these thoughts. We all have watched porn at some point in our life. Mm-hmm. It's like the more we talk about it, the yeah. more we can be free with ourselves. Yeah. And so that's what I love what you're doing. Um, but you. I want to talk about some of the themes from Oh yeah, Sapphire. Absolutely, on. totally. Other than the porn ones, yes. Well, it's just so funny because uh, being part of your same circles, I know we haven't like really hung out, but growing up in Orange County, living in WeHo, going to the Montage yeah. and Ritz Carlton, Laguna Beach, plenty of times, um, having friends in the porn industry, having terrible exes, you have captured them in such a real way. And we know that writing romance is very naked. Mm-hmm. When you write about supernatural or horror, there's the pretense so that this true. is not real. So true. Yeah. And in romance, you're like, you kind of have to pull from your own personal. You really do, from your own body. I mean, it's really yeah. personal, and I di- I wasn't prepared for that because you know I had just come out of uh, come off a, a series I wrote for Amazon Publishing, the Burning Girl series, which was really fun and I really loved it, but it was way more mainstream, and it was really from the yeah. point of view of a straight woman with a, a superpower essentially at her disposal, and it was very different from this. It didn't feel like I was so much more bruised by nasty reviews about Sapphire sunset than I was probably any other book I had written because it was it was so personal and it wasn't like I told this story out of my past it was because these are these are my desires as a queer man these are my hopes and ambitions for an idealized relationship and so when people criticize that it 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 hit much deeper it hit much deeper you are putting everything online you're putting yeah. your ideas of relationship your own experiences yeah um you bring up some very big issues uh, from the dating and sex world from the gay community. Mm. Uh, I'm going to ask you this a little bit later, but Ooh. there's a struggle that happens between wanting a love relationship with the white picket fence and monogamy. Right. In the last five years, I think we've come to this assumption now, and it's been a total flip-flop. Mm-hmm. Before, we used to be like, oh, they have an open relationship, and we used to like whisper about it, or no. they had a threesome. In the last five years, I think it's like, oh, they're monogamous. Right. You deal with this theme... Uh, monogamy versus, uh, you know, having fun and having an open relationship and still being happy in that relationship, whatever. Right. Um, and you kind of give both sides of it. Right. We know, and you have to read the book to see how it ends, but there's kind of uh, uh, a preference given to, to one of those choices. Right. Because it's a romance novel. It's 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 hard, okay. but you're you're right. And I think some of the secondary sympathetic characters are, are not monogamous, yes. you know. But I think when you're, you're telling someone if it's going to be, sometimes it's a thruple, sometimes it can be a quad, whatever, it has to be closed to give the romance audience the happily ever after that they really want. So this is a hot topic then. Yeah. Because I think it's become, especially in the West Hollywood community, we know. 
I haven't been on a like a real first date. The fact that certain characters in the book wait to mm -hmm. engage, that's almost unheard of. And if you don't engage first date, it's like it's you're a weirdo. Really? You think so? Because I have a lot of, you know, so I've been on first dates where it's like a thing. No, Lately? I don't. I don't. Well, no, it's been a while. You're yeah. right. I've been out of the dating pool for a while. Not not because I got hitched either. Just because okay, well, I got I tired. I have all these questions, Christopher. <laughs> we got all these questions. Okay, I'll slow down. Sorry. <laughs> no, but here's, um, it's very interesting because our whole culture has changed. Right. Um, bros, that was, a, was supposed to be a mainstream big hit. It was yeah. a romance. One of the first scenes it featured was a threesome. Mm-hmm. I don't know about your experience, but I think we've all kind of been there. Yeah. Um, whether we wanted to or not. So I wanted to know from your point of view, um, what side of that do you fall in, in terms of open relationship versus monogamy? Well, I'll put it this way. I've never been in a relationship that was open with my knowledge. Um, but I ha it's been a long time since I've been in a relationship. And I think what I was convinced of in my 20s is not what I'm convinced of necessarily in terms of my own, what I need today. Um, I had an interesting experience with the, the third book in the series has a character who identifies as Ace in it, which was new for me. And the, there's a cover-up happening with the sham wedding, and I thought, oh, God, I don't want to write a, a, a cover-up because it's a gay relationship. That feels so old school and... And what they're trying to cover up the celebrity mother of this this rising actress is that she's ace. And I can't sell that narrative. She says, I can't sell the narrative that you don't want to have sex with anybody. She has no understanding of what that means. But that that person also has a desire for deep romantic relationships that don't include sexual intercourse. Which That's, can happen. Which can absolutely happen. And it's a valid identity. So, um, but it for the first time I was looking, well, where do, because that's a spectrum, right? The, 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 the sexuality spectrum, there's, there's ace, there's demisexual, there's sapio, sapiosexual, and there's aromantic, yeah. which is I'm really just about sex. And, 100%. and I had had to, I really took a look about where, and, and I had a conversation with, with a friend recently of the, the am I polyamorous? Am I coming to the realization that I've never really landed with one person because because the irony of this is that I don't hop on grinder and I don't and I've never really been on the apps and I don't like I said I, I would rather about that. I would rather watch porn than have a stranger in my house that's the truth but I, I, and then you're I, kind of done with it. You're like, okay, let's focus I'm, back on work. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Or let's look at three more websites. I don't know. You know, like <laughs> you got to stay you're, current. You're a multi shooter. You gotta start, no, 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 oh, no, oh. no. I'm an edger. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So we we and can, this new term gooning, by the way. This is all new to me, but it makes total sense. It's it goes on a little bit long for me. I think it goes. It you can't know. like for hours. Yeah, that's that's the thing. Like, do you go to the grocery store and you're still gooning, no. and then you go back home? Okay. No. It's like a you yeah. devote the day. Yeah, that's it's like edging Maximus. It's like uh, I'm Latina. We're like sprinklers. We're like, <laughs> <laughs> like what us in five minutes? Yeah, we're there. But anyway, I, to answer your question, I was like, I'm really thinking, like, wow, we're streaming this on YouTube. Um, oh, how the world has changed. Um, I don't I don't know where I fall. I, I, I think, you know, what Donnie says in the book, which I really believe is cheating is about what a couple decides it is. You know, cheating is about a lie and a deception and a betrayal. And that's what Richard has been through. Richard has been cheated on. And he says, if he had come to me asking for an open relationship, I probably would have said yes. But he, he went have behind been happy because his husband has got an agenda that's yep. uh, that's not about being polyamorous. His husband wants to fuck all their mutual friends because it's a power he, play. It's a power play. It's a it's desperation for approval. It's not fundamental to what polyamory actually is. If this is not enough for you to yeah. get Sapphire Dawn, which comes out June twenty fifth, by the way, I don't know what else is. <laughs> Here's hoping. So, would you be in an open relationship? Have you been in an open relationship? I've been in relationships where we we were dating, but we didn't call it monogamous yet because we didn't feel like we had reached that point. I, I think um, I, but when I the a, a declaration of exclusivity defined all of the relationships I was in that I would consider serious. Now they didn't work out. I don't know if that's why they didn't work out, and that was kind of where my head was going with my friend when I had that conversation. Am I polyamorous? Because like. There's an aspect of polyamory where you get really turned on by the person that you're with being with other people. It's not just about you want to go out and play the field. It's like you get really hot. And, and I'm working on- That should on, be on my other podcast. Right. I'm working on- It's an, like voyeurism and expedition. Yeah. Ex ex I totally get that. And I, I'm working on a novella in the Sapphire Cove universe that explores a throuple. And so I'm, I'm dealing with the polyamory of that. So it may just be I'm getting too into character and my friend is like, oh God, he's, he's losing himself in his work. He's not really polyamorous. 
So the answer is, I don't really know because in this moment, I haven't, you know, I have, Eric Shaw Quinn and I talk about this a lot and we talk Free about names. it on our podcast always. My best friend, Eric Shaw Quinn. Um, I have a great life and my life does not feel incomplete You're because content. I don't have a partner. I'm content. I would love to meet someone, but it would need to be somebody who also has a great life or has their own life and we can sort of share certain things together. But the idea of like, I'm not a 23 year old who's out looking to build a home with somebody. I have different priorities now. And I don't know. And my mother said towards the end of her life, you're a bachelor. You're just a bachelor. That's who you are. You like your alone time. You like to be on your own. And I think we're now seeing that that's okay. Yeah. You don't need to find your identity with somebody else. Yeah. At all. I, I totally love and respect that because the happiest I've been is being single lately. Yeah. For the last, I don't know, few years and i had friends say the same thing to me but the happiest time has gone by like the this, happiest i've ever happy. seen you is when you're single yeah, yeah. now do you because i've never seen you on grinder i've never seen you no no, no i didn't never. i didn't get on grinder now the social media the regular social media platform i'm sure you get there. I, yeah. some, some of my friends have sent you messages by the way yeah well, yeah. yeah okay let's not name names but uh yeah <laughs> after when the mics aren't rolling all right uh this is a fan question the characters yes. in uh sapphire cope series are very hot hot twinks hot daddies hot porn stars uh, we're having this conversation about body positivity and body inclusion in the gay community. Do we need to bring those themes into these kind of novels or should we be allowed to just live in the fantasy? We should bring the themes into the novels. I would take exception to the assessment that all of them are traditionally hot. I think that the best romance novels for me are about someone who has been made to feel invisible suddenly feeling seen in the eyes of someone remarkable. And I don't know, everybody seems pretty muscly and fit in this Well, book. Richard is constantly attacked for his effeminacy and his long hair, which can be really controversial in the gay community. I love his long hair, but like, I have I a... Could, I could envision, and when you say yeah. running the fingers through his hair, I, I could feel it. I would also say in Sapphire, Sunset, Connor, who may be my ideal femme, twink bottom... Uh, it get has gotten a raft of shit throughout his life from his own family about his gay voice, and I think, you know, I I read the audiobook and read his gay voice, and some of the responses were a reminder of what people go through. So I think they're not all hot, but if you're asking if I'm going to do a big beautiful man at some point, yes, I am. I will do a big beautiful bear of a man okay. in the Sapphire Cove world because I believe all bodies are beautiful. But as somebody that's a little curvy, yeah, yes, um. I also like to live in the fantasy. That's why I watch sure. porn. That's why I like to read this. Yeah. You know, um, we're still in pride season. Sure. We've seen who's on the floats and all that. Mm -hmm. I don't think body positivity is an act hasn't really taken anchor. I think it's things that people like to say, but I, I don't think- I agree. It, it's not really happening in the dating world. It's not happening on Grindr. It's not happening on Sniffies, which I'll introduce you to. What is Sniffies? I, I honestly am dumbfounded you don't know what Sniffies I don't is. know. It's, I, I, you it's know... Grindr, but in 10 minutes. In ten minutes, yeah. So you, so they just sniff you when they leave, and it takes like really. It doesn't. No, take no, no. Long. It's like grinder now. People want to talk and like all of yeah, this. Okay. Sniffies is like you know exactly where they are on the map. Oh my god. You know exactly what they want. But see, this is the thing with me. I've written so many thrillers. This is like a serial killer's wet dream. Yeah, okay. Like a okay, geolocating. Okay. Like a people. Like I. This was not my idea. Somebody else said to me the old Craigslist ad of just I've left the door unlocked and I'm lying face no, down. That's, that's like a scene from Cruising. That's weird. You know. But I think a lot of people have these needs and that need of excitement oh sure and yeah. the uh anonymity or anonymity, anonymity yeah. yeah and see and that does nothing for me it's that was the odd. thing i discovered i could not get turned on not by a total stranger a anybody but. no no not to kink shame anybody but you discover what what your thing is and anonymity didn't work for me anyway i interrupted you you were to you, okay. you said sniffies and i went off on that road again um it's fine C can you stay a little bit longer yeah of course okay, okay. Yeah. sorry tony tell your husband you'll, you'll be home l later uh we just no. have so much um we're going to get a little deep now. Yeah. Is, is, is that okay? That's fine. Yeah. Um, as an only child raised by my grams and my mom only, mm -hmm. I lost them both and our family dog uh, in a three-year- Oh, God. I yeah. mean, it was the toughest thing. And I, I was not only spoiled, I was like the center of attention. Yeah. Like everything I did included my mom from her playing piano for my cabarets. Mm. Uh, she would come oh, here at the studio. Wonderful. She would pour drinks for everybody. She'd greet everybody. Oh, like that's, that's just- What that's, a loss. Yeah. Um, that was fresh. <laughs> Obviously, you and your mom were very close, and on mm -hmm. top of that, you have this family legacy, and on yeah. top of that, you had been through grief mm -hmm. before. How did you get through that initial moment with your mom, and how do you continue to work through that grief now? Mm. You know, I was thinking about this the other day, and I, there was a moment, the day after she died, 
where I had to talk about the schedule for her funeral and how public yeah. her funeral was going to be. We all were watching. And there were conversations happening like the Canadian NPR wants to talk to you and this is a big enough interview that we think you should do it. Like this was the day after she died. And I thought, my God, is it ever going to stop? And my instinct in that moment was to get it all done as fast as possible. And I made the mistake of promising to the fans that we would do a massive celebration of life for her that year in New Orleans. Because it was already really clear that the funeral, but we couldn't have be a major public event because the Delta variant was spiking. And it was we were back in that place with the pandemic. And um, I made that promise. And it was really, I'm going to say it again, my best friend, Eric Shaw Quinn, who stepped in and said, whoa, we got a lot on our plate. And I said, he said, the funeral can wait until uh, late in January. We need time to breathe. We need time to stare at the wall. And that's what we Heal. did. We just stared at the wall and did nothing. Yeah. Um, but, you know, this is going to be really intense. You, you, people have conversations with you. And they need to have these conversations of, like, if we wait too long, the smell will become an issue. That was something somebody had to say to me the day after she died. And I did have moments of just, like, this is, this is maybe going to be more than I can hold. But at the same by time, for, by myself, but I have an amazing support staff. I mean, but still, you know, when we talk about family wise, right? As the only kid. I'm the only child. Yep. Yeah, I am the only child. It all fell to me. And what I was really experiencing on the grief side of it was, and I, I hope people don't take this in a creepy or inappropriate way, but it was like a marriage to me. I don't, I'm not married. And so my longest and most significant relationship was with my mother. And when I had never experienced anything like that. Now, I lost my father in 2002, and I was in my 20s. But then a new phase of my relationship with my mother began because it was just the two of us, and she moved out to California. But losing her, I, I, I arrogantly thought that losing my father was going to prepare me for that. And it really didn't. They were not at all the same because this was someone I had worked with, someone I had lived with. This was someone I had laughed with and fought with and Eric Shaw Quinn and I were out there every holiday and watching movies both great and stupid I mean it was an enormous loss and I really credit Eric for saying take this breath and we will have the funeral at the end of January come back to LA stare at the wall and I'll tell you the thing that was really also very healing for me was that um, the response from her Facebook page because there was a moment where, towards the end of her life, she had asked me to kind of take over the page for her because her health problems were getting more severe. And um, people were nasty to me. They were not, they were, they were, they said, we don't want you, we want her. And it was in the middle of the pandemic and it really hurt. And it took me a while to sort of bounce back. And so I thought, well, if I go in there now with her gone and they have that response, it may be time to start winding this social media side of it down. And the opposite happened. I would just go in there on Sunday and I would post an old photo of her and the responses would be so warm and so loving and so beautiful. And those people responding um, are the ones who kept that page alive. Because if they hadn't been that forthcoming with their grief and hadn't been so supportive of me, you know, I might have shut it down. So... That, that, I think that sort of gets it, but the, the grief, you know, my mother lost a child, which is maybe one of the worst things a, a human can go through. And in high school, one of my closest friends ended his life, and it was devastating for me. And my mother called my friend's mother, and what she said to her was, you never return to the lightness. You, fi you find the light that exists in the darkness that you now find yourself in. And I never forgot that. I thought it was, I think it's about, it's, it's applicable to any trauma. You know, I, I will go on YouTube and I will, I will listen to 9-11 survivors talk about how they get through that day. And I will think if they can use meditation and yoga to get through memories of being inside the North Tower or the South Tower, I can use it to deal with not only my mother's death, but also LA traffic. You know, all the things that sort of pile up on you in a day. It's a real testament to that. But, you know, I, I, I don't, I have learned that you cannot treat grief like a phase that you wrap up. It never goes away. Because it never goes away. You have to incorporate it into your daily experience. You have to, because what ultimately happens is you, you keep, it turns into vivid memories of the one you love.
right? You know, the memory, your mother playing at your cabaret is just wonderful. I've never heard a mother that supportive. That's But we had our fights fantastic. too. Just, of course, you know, right. Like, she's like, you're dragging this out too long. Don't sing another ballad. You know, that was just yeah, her. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And I mean, we will decide how to remember them. It is up to us. I didn't you know? have her service until two weeks ago when we just celebrated her one year. Death. I, mm. I just couldn't. Yeah. You know, you, you, you just can't. Yeah, I mean, I think I totally understand, and I think you know the the, the delay on the funeral was was not significant. The delay on the celebration of life is because we really only get one shot to do this, and we want it to be a spectacular event. So I hope you'll be there. It's going to be in New Orleans probably when we do it. We'll announce I love it. New Orleans. Yeah, we'll announce it. We've made a promise that we will announce it at who, least who, a year in advance. Because I need to know if I'm allowed back. I, but I don't know who the mayor is right now. I think it's Latoya Cantrell, but I'm not exactly oh, I'm sure. I'm allowed back. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think. One of the biggest trips of my life was to New Orleans for two weeks, mm-hmm. and we met the locals. And that's the number one thing to do is make friends with the locals because you get to know all of the great. Yeah. 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 Oh, I, I will totally, totally, Excellent. totally be there. Um, with so many themes in your family's work and your work dealing with life after death, and we know the supernatural, the paranormal, mm-hmm. and the glamorization of being immortal. Right. What is your current view on spirituality and life after death? Well, you know, it really calls the question when you lose somebody that you love. It really does. I wrote a novel called Decimate that came out shortly after she died that was that laid out a possible vision of what I might believe about life after death. It's really a thriller fundamentally, but it deals with a lot of those ideas. But every time I really sort of try to tackle the subject in my head, um. I get back to, and again, this drives my best friend Eric Shaw going crazy because he hates this concept. I get back to the idea of reincarnation. Reincarnation is where I, I end up. Like, I, I think I fundamentally am very grateful for the life I have lived. So the idea of coming back and doing this again doesn't d- destroy me emotionally. But a lot of people are like, like Eric, are like, oh, I'm not coming back. That's ridiculous. <laughs> tired enough yeah i don't need to do it again but i, they, I have that like Anne ricean desire to be immortal and to see the experiment continue to unfold you know like i don't want to miss the future now maybe i'll be looking down on it from another plane but um i try to take hope in what eric often says that nothing about the universe suggests that energy is wasted or lost it just transforms into other forms of energy well, energy can't go away right that's a scientific fact exactly and so i want to believe you know like i'll have weird moments where i'll wake up suddenly out of sleep i had one this morning where it feels like somebody said something to me the problem is the thing that's said is always really weird like today it was Circe. someone said Circe, and i woke up and i was like Circe, what is this about game of thrones or greek mythology it's i was like greek mythology. right greek mythology i have i have no idea what that's about so um I have had moments where the song that comes on makes it feel like somebody's trying to communicate with me. Um, I, you know, so I I have an open mind, but I'm also very critical of content about it that I think is, uh, I don't know, let's say shortcutty, or it's not really very well thought out. You know, there's a lot of there's a lot of stuff out there that's not well researched, and but there is a lot of stuff out there that is well researched that is just. Dis- not disturbing, but gets your attention. But in terms of the idea of God and like Jesus and, and all these kind of things. I'm not a cr- I know your mom I, was Catholic. She was, I, I think the thing that can summarize my mother's belief is that she never didn't believe in the miracle of the resurrection. I think that's really what it comes down to. I don't believe in the, re- I, I don't believe that. And so um, I, I, in terms of a religious belief system, the closest I've ever got to it is, is some ideas in Buddhism and Taoism, you know, the idea of uh, look around you and what you need is already here. Things like that. Things about being still and being present. You know, like, like I said, the other night I was listening to a woman on YouTube. How, how does she deal with her 9-11 memories being at Ground Zero? And she says, I remind... When people first suggested to me that I try to be present in the moment, what I thought they meant was, you know, get on your guard because in the moment is when they're going to try to get you. And it was like, no, 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 no. In the moment is fine. Your imagination up here, your anxiety up here is where things are messed up. But right now it's you, it's it's Tony over at the computer, it's this table, it's the lovely San Fernando Valley. Like, that's it. That's what's happening in this moment. And so once I was able to reframe that, I got close to developing a spiritual belief system. Just one more quick question, sure. um, and then we're going to wrap up. We're going to talk about your podcast. Um, it must be bittersweet to be the heir to the Rice family legacy. Hmm. 
because with grief, like you said, being present and also looking at the future. Right. Um, you know, me having to wrap up my mom's everything oh, yeah. was, it was so hard. It's and you brutal. having, it, yeah. it's, it is brutal. And so you have to think, well, let's look to the future. Let's look to the future. You're part of this legacy, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, I, that's not my situation. And so you're constantly minded of her characters, her voice, right. her books, um, your father's poems. Mm -hmm. You know, this is... My father's paintings. He left us yes. with th 300 canvases of his artwork oh that I'm deciding how to find a home for. Yeah. And the fans of the Rice family... You know, we we want to we want the dream to still you know cultivate mm -hmm. because it is very modern, like we had talked about. But it must be bittersweet to have to continue to deal with that, but also be like, okay, I need to look to the future for myself, mm -hmm. and you know, I have this going on, but to pay homage to the fans. It is it is um, bittersweet. It is there are moments where it feels confusing. Yeah. Um, but there are also moments where it presents kind of incredible opportunities. I mean, Eric Shaw Quinn and I have a production company called Dinner Partners, which is really going to become the home for future Anne Rice projects, you know, in television and film. It'll produce the celebration of life that we've been talking about. So we, we look at the, the property she has that nobody has really done anything meaningful with, and we think, God, there's so much potential here. There's so much potential in Feast of All Saints. There's so much potential in Cry, well, Cry to Heaven is actually under, <laughs> is actually in development with something. But the things that she has this vast library that we really want to develop, that's very exciting. That's very exciting. I think, you know, there's always been the fact that my voice in the vast majority of my books is very, as you said, it's very different it from is. her books. So I'm not always on her Facebook page saying, I've got another sexy, glossy romance novel coming out because the majority of Anne Rice fans might not bite. A, a fair amount of them will, but it's not, I believe in truth and advertising, but I also believe in marketing projects appropriately. So there are moments where I think, you know, oh God, I have said, am I, am I going to have to abandon my own writing to be the CEO of the Anne Rice legacy. Yeah. And the answer that I've arrived at is that if I wake up early enough in the morning, I don't. You know, because I think <laughs> the myth of, of monastic silence and going off to the cabin and writing your brilliant masterpiece, most writers don't work that way. Not Most anymore. writer, right? You can't. You nope. le you We're learn. We're too busy. We got too much shit to you, do. We got to pay bills. Right. You learn how to write where you can. And you know, I got the Sapphire Cove series written by waking up at six in the morning and doing it before anything else could intrude. And then once I had done something on it that day. It was time to take the emails and it was time to talk to the lawyers. Yeah. I spend most of my time talking to lawyers. <laughs> I said that the other day. And they're wonderful. And some of them have worked for us for years. But, but you're having to relive yeah. like, what has happened. That is that is a thing. But, you know, and, and that's the thing. Talking to a friend recently who has gone through this is is there are certain aspects of the, just the business of death and the business of grief that you can't rush. Yeah. And so you have to find a way to syncopate, if you will, or to alternate. You know, you have to be like, okay, I, you know, I would love to get all of the death settling conversations, distribute all the death certificates and copies of the will that people are going to ask me for, but you can't get that all done in one fell swoop. Nope. No. All right. Eric Shaw Quinn, how did you guys meet? He's like your entertainment oh, my God. partner in crime. We you guys were, have an empire. We, we Yes, we, we, an empire indeed. He is the emperor. Um we were introduced by friends. He had no idea who I was. He thought my ears were big and weird. And he always tells, every time he tells the you know story. What they say about anyway. Yeah, that's, that's it. It's true, by the way. Um, I heard, by the way. Every, <laughs> West Hollywood. Not denying it. <laughs> not denying it. 46, taking it where I can get it. <laughs> that is confirmed. Rumors, Absolutely. <laughs> um, not, I'm not denying it. You know, the thing that I think is that the older, the older you get, if this is the, the, like the Greek myth paradox, right? The older you get, the less you care about what people think about your sexuality and your sex taste, but the you less, care a little bit. the less you have the body that they would want to experiment with you on those things. <laughs> like we get older and we, we age in reality. <laughs> I'm not. I'm not fishing for compliments. I'm not fishing for compliments. <laughs> Honey, they're there. I I can't tell you what my ridiculous emails look like. I'm oh, like, okay. I'm not asking that. Anyway. Okay. Well, you know, you can send them to me, and we'll see if I ask. So it, it must have been refreshing to yeah. meet this personality who didn't know. Who oh you yeah, were right. We're talking like, about Eric. Suddenly yeah. we were talking about. Big. Oh yeah. no, you said Eric. You just said Eric. Eric, Shaw, Shaw. Quinn. Quinn. There we go. Eric okay. Shaw. I don't want him Quinn. to sue us. I know. If I say <laughs> it's trademarked. Yeah. Eric Shaw Quinn. Um. So 
we were introduced by mutual friends. He had no idea who I was. And then I, he said, you know, Ryder's LA. We'll go out to coffee. And when I called, I left my full name on his voicemail, Christopher Rice. And he, cause he was saying, I'm not going to help this kid get an agent. I don't know why they're introducing me to this little guy. And I was, and then he was like, Oh, he doesn't need an agent. He's Christopher Rice. And we hit it off and we became friends. He's from the South. He was like me. He's a loud gay writer. And, um, we saw the world in he's a, a very selling author too. He's a, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Very, we saw the world in a very similar way. And, uh, it was inevitable that we would start a podcast together. When we first started our podcast, it was a sketch comedy show, celebrity interview podcast. Yeah. The and it was right. called Internet Radio. Tony, do you remember? Yes. Uh, you guys started in 2012, yeah? Well, everybody thought that was going to be the thing. We, our attitude towards podcasting was like, we don't podcast her for the weak. Podcasts are for the lazy. We're going to have live listeners and yep. and... And they all you listen to the podcast yeah. is what they did. It's podcast where some weirdo in their garage, <laughs> yeah. you know. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Talking about Marvel, um, which we talked about a fair amount. So anyway, that we, we uh, he's the closest friend I have. I mean, we've been friends for, I think we calculated the other day, over 20 years. And now. he's been part of this Oh, yeah, process. he was one of Anne's incredibly close yeah. friends. She loved him. Uh, Cousin Eric, she used to call him. That was fresh. <laughs> Where does your chemistry come from? Because you guys have a certain magic when you're on air, well, in real life, I guess, too. Well, I think some of it comes from the foundation of the friendship that's built over the years. Yeah. I th as Eric always says, we just record our conversations and make a podcast out of it. Uh, Which so, so many people try to do, and it's not successful. Well, you know, like we, we as his mo late mother, who passed away recently, said, you all can just go on and on forever. As she said, and I think we can, and I think that's about- We've experienced that here tonight. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Having similar minds. I, just, I didn't even have caffeine or booze. I just, you know, I've been home I've alone had, all day. I've had both. Yeah. Good. Um, you, Your show has kind of pivoted a, as well. Yeah. Now you're doing true crime, uh, crime, and I have to give you guys a huge shout out for Pride. Mm. You've done true crime about the LGBTQ community. Yeah. That must have been really tough. Well, it is tough. It it Matthew Shepard was tough. Yeah, that, that brought that, up. That was your last episode. That was our last episode. That was tough. I mean, we hadn't talked about it in a while, and we'd been I'd been delaying it. Eric had wanted to do it last year, and I went, "Oh God, Matthew Shepard," because it's it's one thing to be talking about a Dateline episode where we're talking about are we seeing the true story? What did the cops grew up here to be talking about our Matthew? I think as we all feel about him yeah. in the community, and it, particularly those of us who lived through it. So there, there is that. But, you know, I think the most seismic thing that we did was was we helped solve the murder of Billy Newton. This is true. This yeah. is absolutely true. Can, can you hear Sharon? You know, we were the, the, the there's a very long version of this story, which you can find at the dinner party show dot com. All our episodes on this case are on our, our dedicated Please page. Go, if you're not already a fan, because you guys have a lot of fans. It's it was um, we just we did an episode about cases we'd been obsessed with. There was a kidnapping case Eric had been obsessed with. And I was obsessed with the murder of Billy Newton in 1990. The severed head and feet of this fairly well-known gay porn star were found in a dumpster in Hollywood. And the case had never had a lead, never had an arrest. And I thought, what, what is this about? As anybody outside of the community, the only people who'd really written about it were um, in the adult entertainment industry. J.C. Adams, Mickey Ski, there were all these. If you wanted to learn about the case, you had to find back issues of those old publications that How used to be in print, that? like Man Shots. Yeah. So I started digging and I got a newspapers.com account and I discovered that his father had passed away and that he had a sister who was still alive in Wisconsin and that the, the LAPD had tried to reopen the case in 2011 and they hadn't gotten anything. And it was just, why has this case gone 30 years? And I, I went to Eric and he, he said, you know, let's build awareness about it. He said, let's not act like we can solve it, but let's get, because we knew that if anybody knew anything, it was a queen our age who probably lives in Palm Springs now. And that's a really big part of our listeners' audience. 100%. Right. They're at the bar, they're at happy hour, and they're telling their stories. Yeah. So we created a tip line. We, I got in touch with the cop who discovered the body. I start, we just started sort of investigating it and researching it and talking about it. And this was during the pandemic. So like my obsession during the pandemic was like gruesome police files and all this sort of stuff. There's a very long version of the story. I'll tell the shorter version, which is that we got a tip from a guy who said, I was in Rage Nightclub the last night Vic, Mickey was, uh, Billy was seen alive and I was hitting on this really hot guy and Billy hooked up with the guy and left with him. And that guy either was Jeffrey Dahmer or looked a lot like Jeffrey Dahmer. And I got this story and I thought, oh, fuck. 
if if we run with this, all anybody's going to talk about is Dahmer, whether he yep, did it yep, or yep, not. Yep. I absolutely believe the tipster, whose name was Ron Wheeler, uh, saw Billy leave in the company of a gentleman who looked a lot like Jeffrey Dahmer, whether or not it was Dahmer. Anyway, so I we were putting together an episode that day. I cracked open a book on Jeffrey Dahmer. I should say, more accurately, I downloaded an ebook so that I could search it and see if there was anything to immediately disprove that Dahmer could have been in California during that period. And instead, what I found is that there was a suspicious gap in his murders in Milwaukee around that time, and that he had around that time also reunited with his mother in California. Fuck. So we ran with that. And what ultimately happened, again, believe it or not, this is the short version, is that somebody took that lead to some Facebook groups uh, gay men in the Midwest saying, do you know anything about this? And that brought the story and Billy's story to the attention of a man named Clark Williams, who was a former social worker and an empty nester, a gay parent uh, in a long-term marriage, who basically made the case his obsession. And he fucking solved it. And the LAPD in the interim got in touch with us and started coming on the show. And the LAPD cop, Detective Lamberti, said to us, if I hadn't found your podcast, I might have put that case back. I know, I get a little Does emotional. that give you the chills? It does give me the chills because you're thinking, like, what the hell can I do that somebody hasn't already done? And that is the idea that stands in the way of a lot of great acts, you know, and a lot of great ideas because... We use the platform Even we had. writing. What can yeah. I write that somebody else hasn't done? But- Absolutely. And so Clark, you know, it's the story's all at the dinnerpartyshow.com and the LA Times also reported on it. But Clark basically did, a, did a, a profile of everybody Billy had done porn with. And he discovered that a fellow performer who was in LA around the same time uh, was later convicted in another state for um, basically white supremacist gang initiation murders of queer men. And he had said around his arrest that he had committed several murders in L.A. And Clark connected the dots. He brought it to Lamberti at the LAPD in the Homicide Division. Lamberti calls us. This is three weeks after he's come on our show and say, the Dahmer lead is dead. We can't get anything else out of it. We don't have enough DNA to keep testing. All this sort of stuff. And then he says, I'm on my way to Oklahoma to investigate a potential lead. You can't tell anybody yet, he says, which drives us crazy. And we're like, you're coming on our show as as soon as you've got this you can talk about this. Um, and he went and interviewed a prisoner named Daryl Lynn Madden, who uh, had transitioned in prison from male to female and confessed to the murder. Holy shit. Yeah. It was just, and that was that was several years of just thinking we were boring everybody by talking about this case, but it it, it wasn't about, it, it made its way to the right person, who was Clark. It made its way to somebody who had the time and the ability. And that's something we see a lot in talking about true crime stories on our podcast is is that um, a lot of times what law enforcement doesn't have is the time to they solve the case. They're underpaid. They're, they're underpaid. Overworked, they're right. tired. Yeah. And we know the gay cases are going to be last. I, but I'll tell you, this is what we kept finding. And I won't, I won't take sure. over your show talking about Billy Newton is everybody we talked to who had been interviewed did not say the police did not pay attention to this. They may have focused on the wrong guy for too long and could never really gin up anything about him. But there were the, people who said the police brought them in to talk to him said they had files and files on this case on the desk. It was so gruesome That's surprising. and so disturbing. And Wendy Barrett, who reopened the case in 2011, did so because she became the captain of the station where she used to work. And she said this case was her white whale. She really wanted to solve this case. And so she retired and then it was solved later. But it was gratifying for her. It's like something you see on TV. Like it is. They make episodes yeah. about this. Yeah, totally. Christopher, what can't you do? Oh, you're so sweet. You're so sweet. Um, um be patient. <laughs> Apparently, I can't. I can't be married. That that hasn't materialized. But if that's yet. not your thing, then that's not your Maybe thing. It's not. Yeah. You just have to meet like a Meriwether or something. Yeah, absolutely, Richard. Mar- I yeah, Richard. Mar- I'm more of a. I know exactly who your characters are. By the way, that's how yeah. good you write. I'm like, I know, I know, I know. I love that. I yep. love that. Um. Okay. We didn't even get to our hot topics. I just want to point out, uh, we have a lot of Trekkies oh, yeah? that are followers, and I'm a huge Trekkie. Are you? You did a post about watching Star Trek Four during COVID. I love Star Trek Four, but you don't Trek, Trekkies don't like Star Trek Four. What the hell are you talking Tony, about? I have, uh, Tony, how many, how many Trek no, actors have we had, and how many Trekkies? Do they like Star Trek Four? Because I always get this attitude of, like, you're not a real Star Trek it's, fan if you like Star Trek time, Four. Let me tell you what Star Trek Four was. 
It was Sapphire Cove <laughs> to all your work because your work is, some of it's pretty heavy. Yeah. This is when we got to relax and enjoy. Yes, right. The and, writing. And, and wasn't that why Leonard Nimoy wanted to do? He's like, we did Wrath of Khan and the search for Spock, and they were both really heavy, yep. and it's time to do Humpback Whales in San Francisco and have a That's good time. Much, yes. And I lived in San Francisco when it came out, so I loved it for that reason. Well, you watched as a little boy. Oh, yeah. I mean, when George. And they Sak- let land in Golden Gate. And when George Sakai says San Francisco, I was born there, the whole theater went nuts. Like, yeah. we all cheered. It was yeah. amazing. Anyway, yeah. okay, I had to bring that up. Yeah. Um, there's. I, I still have. You you have to come back. Yeah. I'll come back. Absolutely, okay, you have to come back. Yeah. Um, I just want to know what do you want most from your future career because there's so many different directions you can go in, mm. and I can't even imagine that pressure. Because mm. you have to think, obviously, financially. Uh, right. You have to think about yourself. Right. And like we talked about, you have to think about the family legacy. Mm-hmm. What do you want most from your future? Well, I think I very much do want to keep Anne's legacy alive. I think that's something that Eric and I are very committed to. I think, and in, I love that you have somebody to help you with that who yeah. has been part of that. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And I think so. That, so that's very important. I think that this is going to make me sound possibly like a grumpy older person, but um, your career is going to be what it's going to be, and I think you want to show up and you want to try for the stuff you're really passionate about. But um, you have to be willing to adapt to what happens because it's not all going to go perfectly. So I don't make too many long-term plans, really, when it comes. That's how I stay sane. I do. There is a part of me that I've always got a reservoir of stuff I want to write. I've always got a, a reservoir. Of, a reservoir is maybe not the right term. I've got a folder full of ideas, yeah. and some of them gain, le- some of them grow legs, and some of them don't. And so I always want to be writing a book that I care about. But I think the most important, if I have an agenda, it's to tell stories about queer men that maybe didn't exist when I was younger. You know, and and it's not to say I'm the only one telling them, but they weren't, I don't know if there were books like this in 1996. I don't think they would have been popular. They would have been dismissed as too mainstream and too, too, um, too shiny and too glossy. Everything needed to be a little bit more serious or needed to be a murder mystery or just a total screwball sex comedy. A romance. Or it had to be so like, gay that it was uh, it was a porn in... Yeah. 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 So I, I don't know. And it is, I want to fill in the gaps. And right now, the thing that I have a really burning obsession with is historical fiction and and excavating so the history of, of queer people who have been erased from history. Yeah. You know, like I, I get obsessions with... with reportedly gay monarchs in history and I look at has anyone ever told this story so that's what's really kicking around up there a lot you know and I've got a big novel about 9-11 and how it upends the lives of gay men in New York you know like I've always got a bunch of stuff and what what steps to the forward usually does so organically as a result of what's happening around me an opportunity either presents itself for that idea or it doesn't what's it like to be your friend do you ever just like hang out and like play Jenga you know, I haven't played Jenga in a long time. I used to play so hard. Because you're like doing all these big things. I, well, you know, like, and that's the thing. I have to make myself be social. I'm one of you those have people. To. I have. I love my home. I have a great place to live. And I sometimes you had a plumbing accident. Though. I had a plumbing disaster. I had a plumbing disaster, and it was so jarring for me because I love my thing. home. Your safe space. Is yeah, a whole half where I work, me. where I sit and read, was destroyed. Yeah. You know. So yeah. But I hope I'm a good friend. I'm. I'm somebody who has never had like. I make very close friendships with people, with like a few certain people. And then I have wider friendships, but I usually um, like pair bond with friends. I think the older we get, it just shrinks. Yeah. And that's okay. Mm, because totally. Because we know that those people will be here. Um, you, you have to come back. Tony, I am so sorry. Tell your husband you're going to be there soon. Um, last question. What's your message to your fans? Oh, you know, I I was driving over here and I was on social media and I was seeing uh, Bookstagrammers, if you know what that is. It's like books talkers, but for Instagram, complaining about how they have these accounts that are devoted to the books they love, but they're not getting any traction. And I just wanted to, I didn't type because I was in the car and I was, I wasn't driving. Burr him with like a fire. I was, it was, I know it was bad on the way over, but I wasn't driving, but I was, anyway, um, you don't know how much your response can mean to an author. And so you may be out there talking about the books you love, but if you're writing something that's really complimentary about an author and you're tagging them in it and it's reaching them, you don't know how vast the impact you could have had on them and on their day. And so I think what I w- the message I have for my fans, for my readers, is 
your feedback is always really valuable. And your enthusiasm for a thing, even if you feel like your platform isn't significant, is valuable. It really is. I'm enchanted. Oh, I'm just enchanted. Um, tell our audience where you want them to find you and follow you. Well, we talked a lot about the Dinner Party Show podcast with Eric Shaw Quinn. That's all at the dinnerpartyshow.com. And it sounds like that's going to be the place to go. Yeah, we got a lot going on there. We, yeah. we put out a new podcast every Sunday. Um, yeah. So, you know, we got another one coming. We're going into the studio to record uh, on this Saturday. Um, so there's that that's going on. Uh, Sapphire Cove has its own website, the series. It does. Visit Sapphire Cove. Yeah. And I'm going to be honest. I never picked up a gay romance novel. Mm-hmm. Um, I was sent this. And I read through it. Uh, you don't. It's the fourth in the series. It's the fourth in the series. You don't have to read all the others to no. get this and enjoy yeah. it. But I didn't realize it's like a link. Yeah. Character. Each of the characters that are in Sapphire Dawn have had their own spotlight. Mm-hmm. So I ordered all the. Oh, books. I love hearing that. I, Absolutely. I can't wait for the box. I'm like, everybody talk to me. All right. Yeah, but uh, the books have different flavors too. Like the second one, very intense. Very intense. Deals with some really heavy issues. The first one is, I, I love it. It's more. It's way more fun. It's way more soapy. The third one, also intense, but kind of about grief. So like you know. What I love though is that the characters all intertwine. Yes, yes. that's what I, that's what I love. That world, yeah, yeah. So see Travis Rice, get all the books. And Thank you. Have a good all time. the books, ten copies of the books for Christmas, <laughs> for Hanukkah, for all your friends. All right, we have to bring you back because fan questions. We will get to them on part. Two. Absolutely. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for having After me. This so is wonderful. After so many years trying to get you on the be- show. I can't believe it was that hard because you're great. I never dealt with you directly except for that one drunken. I was like, oh, you're going to come on my show. And oh. you're like, mm, okay. No, I was probably like, Let me get, do you have a card? And you're like, no, I lost them all. <laughs> I'm on iHeartRadio. I don't, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, that's it, folks. It's always a grab bag of fun here. A big thank you to our engineer and station owner, Tony Sweet, especially for staying late tonight. And I'm going to hear about this. Our social media clip editor, Alexis Mendez. Coming up, we have one of my favorite actresses. She's that Persian lady with that smoky voice. Oh, sorry. Uh, Josh right. Lou. She's coming up. Oh, my God. Yeah. yeah. Just for car service. Mm, we'll see. Uh, <laughs> we also, I can't name who yet. We also have Drag Race Queens and OC Housewives coming your way. Mm-hmm. Please like, share, subscribe so we can continue bringing this uh, to you for free, by the way. Until next time, stay happy, stay healthy, stay sexy, stay reading, and if you drink, stay tipsy. This has been another episode of On The Rocks. Tweet me and slide into my DMs on Twitter and Instagram at On The Rocks On Air. Find everything On The Rocks for free at ontherocksradioshow.com. Subscribe, like, review, and share. Until next week, stay fabulous.